My guest today is Brandon from Mind Shift. His content is amazing. And he has this opening line in his about section that really like, I think I, I think when I read it, I was like, I need to get this man on my podcast. So he said, my goal is to be open enough to follow the truth, no matter where it leads and to help others do so also, uh, do that also. It's with my great pleasure that I introduce Brandon from Mindshift. Welcome to Deep Drinks Podcast. What's up, David? Man, thanks for having me here. Man, I I just like I said just then, I really loved that that um, kind of mantra when I when I was deconstructing my um, faith. I wrote this document called "The Objective Truth of Origins." I was trying to get to the bottom of of where we came from, and you know, like I was deconstructing young earth creationism. Hmm. And at the start of it, I said. I like wrote this like mission statement and the mission statement was essentially along those lines. Like truth is the most important thing. We must follow the evidence where it leads, not try and get our, the evidence to fit our already decided conclusion. And when I read that and when I enjoyed some of your content, I was like, damn, this, this man, I, I just want to have a conversation with this man. And so that's when I reached out. Um, very thank cool. You very much. kind. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, we were talking a little bit before and it's nice just to find someone that's like-minded and, have a conversation that's not uh not so much pressure we can just hang out and talk religion and yeah. all that good stuff well uh so we're drinking rye whiskey today right and i've got uh my whiskey that i, I went and bought is called the gospel um so <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a good it's a good australian solera rye uh what have you what is your rye? Do yeah that's great i don't have any good puns this is a uh, high west <laughs> I figure that's good, oh. me being an American with you. Uh, High West is out of Park City, uh, Utah, which is which oh, is right. also ironic because it's like the driest state in the country. But they make <laughs> an amazing, this is the double rye. They have one called Rendezvous. If you ever get a chance to get your hands on, it's my favorite, but it's pretty expensive. So um, cheers. Cheers. Well, I, oh, sorry, I forgot to pull mine. I don't know what, what I'm doing here. But um, oh, man, it's... Uh, Whiskey is like one of my favorite. It's probably my favorite drink, I think. Um, Hard to so beat. Shows up. Uh, so first question to get, to get us rolling is um, everyone knows that us atheists, uh, we we stop following God because we love to sin. So my first question is, what's your favorite sin? Oh, man. What a funny, interesting little question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. That's a good question. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just so ironic. What is my favorite sin? Why don't you tell me yours so that I can uh, see where the pace is at here? Scoffing. I love to scoff, um, you know, to scoff at uh, at the ideas that are in the Bible. Um, yeah, that's probably my, my favorite sin. I'll, I'll do similar. I would have to say blasphemy, which we know is the victimless sin. But uh, that's something that obviously has become a big part of my life uh, the last few months here. So is it is it blasphemy like what is um or there's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit right and then there's like just blas what is blasphemy just think, in general I think blasphemy in general is uh, speaking against God right I, it's you know I remember the first time I ever heard the term uh, I was in sixth grade and I had I had done something terrible I watched an episode of The Simpsons and we were talking about it at my Christian school do you know The Simpsons Oh yeah, yeah. everyone knows yeah. The Simpsons right Okay. Yeah. Um, and my history teacher, uh, again, at a Christian school was like, you shouldn't watch that. It's sacrilegious and blasphemous. And I never heard either of those terms. And so that's always been like the definition in the back of my head was, you know, poking fun at religion or making light of God. Um, obviously, now in our understanding that there is no God, there is no blasphemy. And I think that's why it's such a fun little thing. But <laughs> it's uh, that would be that would be the one. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, in Australia, like The Simpsons was big in Australia, but especially in like my demographic, like kind of like poor, uh, <laughs> we just like Simpsons at like six o'clock every night. That was like our, our thing. Like I grew up with The Simpsons. Um, and uh, yeah, so so you've told your deconstruction before. Uh, and uh, but I was wondering if we could just go through uh, some of like the, I guess, the hits of your deconstruction. Sure. But I get the vibe that uh, a lot of I mean, there's there's a hundred ways you can tell your deconstruction, but I get the vibe for you that that you're 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 quite um, inquisitive into what you believe and why, and you and you kind of found issues with the Bible, issues with the concept of God, that kind of facilitated part of your deconstruction. And I was wondering if we could just like kind of touch on what your construction deconstruction was like through the lens of, I guess, some issues that you were finding. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've said before, and I want to try to always reveal a little bit of something different or more uh, as we go through this kind of stuff, but really there's two levels. There was breaking away from fundamentalist Christianity, and then there was breaking away from Christianity in general, or even a God concept in general. Those are two very different things. Uh, so as a kid, you know, I like to think that I was of the same kind of analytical mind. Uh, I saw a lot of issues. I was just easily, you know, you're a kid and, and some adult figure, some authority figure says, that's not an issue. And here's why. And they give any answer. And all you want is there to be an answer when you're young and you're supposed to believe in this thing. So, you know, so much that I look back on now about issues I had as a very early kid, all the way up through, you know, high school, I see that it was just quashed by other believers and the institutions that are there to reinforce the indoctrination. You know, I went to Christian schools, mm -hmm. I was involved in Christian programs, uh, even certain aspects of my sports teams were Christian, Christian coaches, all kinds of influence, and it's there to hold you in. And so, yeah, that analytical mind, I think, was always there. It just took 30 years before I was brave enough or smart enough, or I don't know exactly what the tipping point was. Uh, well, I do know the tipping point. It was having children. Um, and, and I just remember having a real moment of pause that was like, I've accepted a lot of apologist answers. I've accepted a lot of excuses. Would I feel comfortable though, explaining these excuses, being the person then that's now giving them to my kids as they come up? Yeah. Because I saw really early on, I remember I was like sitting with my son, he was two, we were reading and he, you know, he's two. And it was like the littlest kid's book ever. And he asked a really good question. And I was like, that's such a good question. I love you, man. Like what a smart mind you have. And then I thought, shit, like I'm gonna be responsible for answering all of this stuff for the rest of time. And it was the catalyst I needed that pushed me over the edge to say, okay, let's, let's really like uncover all of those things from my childhood and go through them one by one. And that initial deconstruction process was never to become an atheist. It was never okay. to like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm definitely, there is no answer for the problem of evil. Oh, there is no answer for slavery. There's, there's just got to be a better one than the excuses I've gotten from these not very smart Christians in my life. Right. And so it was, it was really to know God better. Um, that funny enough, of course, leads to more Bible reading, which as you and I both know, can kind of be the nail in the coffin for so many of us. <laughs> so we can get into some specifics if you have questions, but that's like the general tone of, of how it went. And there's so many ebbs and flows and so many times of like, man, my faith is great. Nothing's going to get in the way. There's mysteries, all the excuses about, you know, God being higher than myself. And then there were other times of like, how am I ever going to explain this or excuse this? Like this is this is insane. Why does no one else have a problem with this? And you feel so isolated <laughs> oh, when, you're, yeah. when you're in there, you know? I'm laughing because it's just so, it's so uh, symbolic of, of my experience as well. Like it's so, it's similar. Like I think that um, for me, I first saw the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate and I was like, let's, let's get to the bottom of this young earth creationist thing, you know? And, uh, and I remember thinking to myself, well, hang on, I can't like investigate the evidence and be like, how does this all point to God? I have to like, Mm, yeah. I have to, I have to like come into this this evidence and just see where this one little piece of evidence like points to, right? It's I, like, I know that oh, debate you're talking about. How old were you during this? I'm curious. Ooh, it would have been. Oh, I would. It was about 2000. I think it was about 2016 when okay. I watched it, or 2015, 2016, and it was that was out in 2014. So, uh, I'm 34 now. So, someone did the maths. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I just, I was just roughly curious, uh, you know, at, at what's how long you held on to that. It's, it's insane looking back. And I know that yeah, so sure. many, even Christians today, they will immediately not take what we have to say that seriously because of our fundamentalist background. Like, mm. oh, you were in that crazy Christian cult. Like, you were in the wrong side. You were in the weird side. Like, obviously, the earth isn't, you know, that young and, and things of this nature. And it's embarrassing to, to say how, you know, 2016, man, you were well into your twenties. Uh, it's embarrassing <laughs> for both of us to be like, oh yeah, we, we really believe this, but we had no reason not to, and every reason to believe it from our, our background and our upbringing and our, again, our influences. So I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just curious. Um, no, that that's cut me off as much as you like. And I'll probably do the same, especially as the whiskey takes over. I, I, I become less of a gracious host, but, um, but oh, well, less of a good host. Sorry. So what I would have pointed back to, but what I would have pointed to back then is I would have said, if someone like questioned me, like, how do you explain, explain this? How do you explain this? How do you explain this? I would have just pushed back to my experiences. Mm. Like, I don't know. 
but I know that I've had these experiences with God. I know that he's answered my prayers. I know that I've spoken in tongues. I know that I've laid hands on people. And that's what the Bible says will happen to those who are true followers. And so I'd point back and I'd say, okay, so therefore the Bible has, like, therefore the Bible is, is true. Or therefore I'll put my faith in the Bible. So I'd always point back to experience. I can never deny the experiences that I had. I'm curious, what was your, uh, I guess, impetus? Like, what did you have experiences that you would point back to that would, like, hold the foundation of, of everything? Or was it just how you were brought up? Yeah, it was probably a triple threat. It was experience. It was biblical knowledge. Um, I was really involved in Bible study and even as a kid, like Bible quiz for, you know, like eight years of my life. Like I took that as seriously as those crazy parents that take, you know, their kids to basketball camp at age four, you know, to prepare them for the NBA. Like it was <laughs> heavy duty. I mean, hours of study a day from the very beginning. And so it's interesting because that should have been so many red flags because I read all the verses that now drive me insane that I ever accepted, but I had what I consider to be the right context and a good understanding of, of how to make excuses for them. So falling back to like, no, other people don't understand the Bible as well as I do, which is stupid. And then falling back to personal experience. Um, and I said triple threat because there was a third one there that was um, probably just indoctrination, right? Just fear mm -hmm. of losing the group and of the safety and the security and uh, the existential dread questions and everything like that. So we could point to any of those from an experience level. It's interesting. I remember specifically having a conversation. I think I was 25. I had a friend that I made when I was 17. She was awesome. We were like so close and we both had the same upbringing. We went to the same church even. And then she deconverted, but hers to me sounded crazy. It wasn't wasn't like smart like i didn't respect it she did lsd one time and then like real she t she solved music at the same time that she like found out there's no god right so like i didn't take her seriously yeah, yeah. but when she was trying to be like brandon like we've been fooled i remember feeling pity for her and specifically saying like you must have not had the relationship i have with jesus mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. and again looking back like it's just horrendous to think about this but i was so convinced you know, more than the other three things I just mentioned of my personal relationship with Jesus, that when I spoke to him, he heard that, that I mattered to him, that he knew what was going on with me, that we were talking on a daily basis. And so, yeah, I have my own experiences of what I consider to be fulfilled prophecy or healings that I saw, you know, growing up in fundamentalist churches, you see all kinds of things that reinforce this belief. But man, probably at the end of the day, my excuse that I fell back on was, okay, if there's issues with all of this, it doesn't change the fact that I know this guy, Jesus, as well as I thought I knew like my best friend or my mom. You, it was it was just that foundational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. So going back to initially what you said about not wanting to become an atheist or not not going into your deconstruction, becoming an atheist. Uh, when I was when I was looking at my Christian worldview and going, okay, I need to need to kind of separate myself from the evidence that I'm looking at, I'm not going into this as a Christian, as a man, as a Australian, as someone who lives on the sunshine. Like I'm not, I'm not looking at this. I'm trying to look at this as unbiased as possible and just see where this little thing points. My expectation was that I would find all the steps back to God. Mm. So I would follow the evidence. I didn't use faith. I would follow the evidence, and those steps would all lead back to God. And then I, and then the purpose of this was then I could then have conversations with people who didn't believe in God and to exp and explain to them what I had discovered, I'm not saying I would have all the answers or anything, but be like, okay, well, or if I, if I found that, um, or at least I would have an understanding of why they don't believe in God or why they believe in evolution or something. And I could at least relate to them on that level. So I could engage in interesting conversations. That was the goal, but for me, I, I started to notice these cracks and these cracks just got bigger and bigger. And then, and eventually I'm standing in these canyons of cracks going like, why hasn't anyone told me about these things? Yeah. And it's, is uh, it was really, um, it's really hard because I remember even going to Christians at the time and telling them like, oh, there's these huge cracks, but I could only see them if I took off, I guess my God glasses and decided to look at the evidence for what it was. And you could see, you could you could physically see on their face, they'd shut off. Like you yeah. start telling them and they, they were just like, and they would just shut off. And then it's like they, they, you couldn't, you actually couldn't get through to them. It's like, it was like, uh, not to get all biblical, but <laughs> it was like when, what Paul had the, 
the things fall off his eyes, the scales fall off his eyes. That's what it feels like. It really yeah. feels like that. And it feels crazy that no one else is noticing these things or wanting to talk about them. Or if they do talk about them, they tell you the most like bizarre, like weird reasoning that you could ever imagine. Like it's, uh, I remember talking to someone about Noah's Ark and it was like, and uh, you know, they were talking to me and they were saying, and I'm saying, wait, so if, I'm trying to work out, like, I worked out, like, 19,000 different species, endemic species are endemic to Australia, and I'm like, of plants, reptiles, like, amphibians, animals, uh, I didn't count birds or or um, fish, and I'm like, 19,000 species, I was like, so that means the seeds would have had to blow all the way to Australia, the koalas would have had to crawl all the way to Australia, surviving on nothing, because they eat only a specific eucalyptus tree depending on where they are. And like, you can't trans, you can't even transport them a couple hundred kilometers away because they won't eat those eucalyptus tree that trees that decide to die in the tree. I talked to, to zoologists. I talked to, to, to people who, um, who raise Australian wildlife who are sick and things like that. And I was like, this just doesn't make sense. And the, the, um, the reasoning I got was, well, um, you know, we don't know, like there was a couple of things like maybe, God repopulated the earth after Noah's flood. Yeah. I'm like, well, that would defeat the purpose of the ark. All the excuses um, for that kind of stuff could be replaced with, well, he's God, he can make a miracle. Like he'll just transport yeah. the slots. And it's like, then why do the ark? Like if we're just yeah. talking Thanos level snapping miracles, like let's skip the middleman. But if you put the middleman in the story, like don't expect me not to like deconstruct it. Yeah. It was very, I think it was harder going from fundamentalism to like progressive Christianity. And I don't know if you ever made a middle stop. You'll have to tell me. Uh, then it was letting go of like the middle ground of what I consider, you know, progressive Christianity to, to atheism because it was so insulated for so long. And yeah, it seems so obvious now, like, and again, I can, I can hear all the Christians who never <laughs> believed in that crap being like, you're so foolish, but <laughs> I, I was like 25 or 26 when I saw that non-stamp collector video about Noah's Ark. And I remember taking notes. I was like, holy shit. Like it blew my mind. And it's, oh. it's unbelievable how otherwise I was, you know, we just talked about books before we hopped on pretty well read as a kid. Like I had finished most of like the Western canon classics by like 21. And yet <laughs> I believed in. No, a literal Noah's Ark. And yet I believed in like Jonah actually being in the belly of a whale. The cognitive dissonance is unbelievable in this religion. Mm -hmm. It's, it really is wild. Uh, oh, you, you say non stamp collector. For me, for me, one of my, my videos for the Noah's Ark was uh, Aaron Ra's series on um, mm. how X disproves the flood. And I think it was. The paleontology one that I just watched over and over again, I was just like so blown away by the fact that like there's like levels of of, of strata in the world that's like um, life is here, it stops here, humans are way up here. Like we've never even seen the like humans, the human race, human species has never seen this this sect of a whole species of like trilobites or something. And you're just like, this is this is wild. Like the Earth is so much older and and more interesting than yeah you know, God wiggling his nose and wishing upon a star and then pop, it all came into existence over seven days. Like it just, and I know Christians will say that, well, obviously Genesis is, some Christians will say that obviously Genesis is poetic and I'm being stupid <laughs> and we were, we were stupid for believing that Noah's Ark was literal. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, that's how I was raised. Yeah, for sure. And also, you know, I could even get on board and I did get on board. I got on board for years and I was the Christian then saying that like, oh no, you need to understand how to do this correctly and the allegories and the metaphors and, and the symbolism and the poetry. And I had a pretty, I had it down pretty packed and, uh, and read a lot of good books on, you know, a, assuming that any of this were true, like this is the only way it can be true. And that's what happens. That's like, I've said it before and I get a lot of pushback. I'd be curious to hear your thought. I think fundamentalism mostly is like one of the more honest interpretations of being a Christian, like mm. you're, you're taking things literally that were originally most likely in some cases, not all, there's definitely, there's definitely poetry and symbolism in the Bible, a hundred percent. Um, but there's also things that are supposed to be taken literally that are insane. You know, I, mm -hmm. I oftentimes make the comparison between the progressive Christians that say how silly I was for believing in Noah's Ark 
but then turn around and they absolutely believe in the 10 plagues of Egypt and the Red Sea being split. Like they, they believe that literally. That's not supposed to be a metaphor, even within the poetry. Like this is supposed to be physical things that actually happened, you know, putting lamb's blood on your door so that an evil spirit passes over you. Like that's, that's insane. That's blood magic cultery. And it's no different to me in impossibility level than Noah's Ark. And yet the, the kind of snotty Christian says, how silly of you to take some of that so true while they have to take a resurrection as pure truth. You know what I mean? Like there's enough yeah. things in the Bible that do need to be taken literally that I don't think it's an insane step for a fundamentalist to be like, well, these people seem to believe it at the time. And <laughs> so I did too. But um, I don't want to get too hung up on that because again, it is just, it's such a... Well so uh I, the, i'm friends with eric uh, manning of testify apologetics um he's been on the show before uh and and uh he he posts stuff that i disagree with like on on like a wild level and he disagrees with me as well um but i appreciate his the conversations i have with him and he posted something the other day that i was literally too scared to comment on because i knew that that i was going to get a wall back of of like sophistry like of just like excuses and stuff so this is the post that he posted on on facebook uh when you find out that there's actually historical evidence for the jesus those bible scholars lied to me and it's like i, I really wanted to ask i really 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 wanted to ask what is the historical evidence for the exodus but i know that what i get back is like i don't know like do, do we have do we have like the the side of the red sea crossing do we have egyptian records that say millions of jews were living in uh, Egypt, or is it going to be something like, well, there are some some groups that were associated with the Israelites that were like as as far like west as 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 Egypt, and you know, and there's some like tales of uh, of you know, traveling great distances, and like, is it going to be like the Bible story? Is it going to be something that's so sep like different, yeah. and you know, and it's just it's it's uh it's frustrating. Yeah, I should ask. I should ask a question. It gets pretty loosey goosey. I think that's the hard thing. It's like, as soon as you have to make an excuse for something that either has little evidence, counter evidence, or is just what otherwise we would consider miraculous, whatever category that fits into, as soon as you try to attribute evidence or proof to it, you almost have to change the story most of the time. And then it's like, well, mm -hmm. then what are we doing with the Bible? And then like, oh, you're too hung up. You're, you're too literal. You're too textual. And it's, I, I fight this issue a lot, even with like other atheists who are like, man, you're just really taking it too literally. You're too hung up on it. It's like, if we don't have the source material and like, I know the Catholic answers about church tradition and church teaching, but still, and I understand we haven't always had texts. Like there was a belief system before a lot of this stuff was put down uh, on scrolls, even during the exile period. I, I get all that. But the only reason anyone today prays to Jesus and thinks that they receive the witness of the Holy Spirit and believes that they can pray for healing or talk in tongues or do anything, or even more progressive, like just that Jesus loves them. The only reason they believe this is because of the Bible. Without that, you don't just walk out of the woods from Papua New Guinea knowing the name of Jesus. It's It just doesn't happen. There is no level of general revelation that is at all accurate in that regard. And so, you know, when people start to throw away, like, most parts of the Bible to develop a story that works since it becomes more clear every year how how much the bible doesn't work it's like then what religion is this like why are we still attaching it to christianity or the bible and it it becomes an impossible thing to fight and that's why i find myself in a lot of my videos i've got more caveats than points because it's like now listen but if you're someone that believes like this this would be the answer for that and if your excuse is this like here's this and it's so hard to even make a point because there's so much disagreement from christians which is problem number one uh, and if you point that out there's 13 apologetics coming back at you there so i get it man um trust <laughs> nitty's just said uh quick link to the inspiring fossey video at deep drinks um i'm guessing on the exodus uh but but to your point um uh, brandon is something that inspiring fossey said is when he was on last is he believes in uh noah's flood but it was local flood right of and course. it's like so my so like uh, we didn't get into this but my response would be so what was the point what was the point of every animal of every you know like like what what was the point like the, the the story is of god wiping humanity clean right everyone the aboriginals in australia that have been here for sixty thousand years 
Yeah, you too. guys, I love that point. You guys have like the <laughs> oldest going back timeline of if human development. And it's it's amazing <laughs> when it's like 500 times longer than what the Bible gives credence to. But continue. I know. I, well, yeah, that, that's that's essentially the point. It's like it just makes no sense to me then. Like the story of Noah just makes no sense. It's like God wiping out a select group of people and some select animals for some purpose. Like it just, it takes all the the Disney out of the movie. Do you know what I mean? It takes all the magic out of it. It's just, it's no then, longer interesting. It's no longer like a moral tale. It's no longer, it's just, what is this? It's just nothing. I think what it points to when people talk about the local flood and they have good, good reason to do so in terms of some of the passages, other than the fact that like the whole earth and these, these Hebrew words are used that do mean all encompassing everything. Like it's pretty hard to get around, but on that argument, it also shows how little God's reality was like these people really believed their local flood. If they believed that was a worldwide flood, like they were just so they didn't know about the Americas. They hadn't gone that far, you know, even East. It's just, I did a video. I'm not trying to promote anything, but I did a video called beyond God's borders. And it's like, my biggest issue is the, the hyper local, hyper specific, idea of a God that only cares about this chosen people group amongst like a few other evil nations around them. And that's the whole world. Like all of the events that are described is that's where it's taking place because there just wasn't anything else. You know, you can go as far as Egypt and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and up North, you have some hill people and these kinds of things. But <laughs> the, the idea that they would have been writing about a worldwide flood that had anything to do with people in South America and that they would have understood this to any degree. Like, obviously we know, of course they didn't. And that makes sense. But when you claim that God did it, he should have. And so it just, it breaks down. It just breaks down for so many reasons. Yeah. There's this, there's this famous uh, image. Uh, it's not going to come up very well, but that little circle there, uh, I'm not going to even show it, but that little, it's like a little circle on a map. Here, let me show it again. A little circle there that's like every every single thing by Yahweh, Jesus, Allah, the Torah, New Testament, Quran, inside that little circle. Yeah, that's great. And, like, and, you know, you say you won't promote, you know, you don't want to promote your kind of stuff, but I'll promote it because it's amazing. People, everyone, go subscribe to Mindshift. It is an incredible channel. And I didn't realize you're putting out multiple videos a week. I honestly thought these would take you weeks, months to make each one. They're really good. Like, you must, you just... You've obviously condensed years of books into your mind, and now they just flow forth like springs, as the Bible would say. <laughs> but you, your your content is really good. It's really easy to listen to. Really natural. You're not um you're not kind of YouTubery. Does that make sense? Like you're uh, go subscribe to Mindshift. The links are in the description. I appreciate that. Incredible. Yeah, I I you know I started out and it was like, so I I told you before I hopped on. I had a booktube channel, and just. I, one of the books I covered, I think it was like, uh, is it called The Big Picture by Sean Carroll? You know, it made it. So I made a comment while covering that video because there's a lot in there about atheism. And someone was like, oh, you're an atheist, like share your deconversion story. I was like, that doesn't fit, but I'll do it. So that was like the first non-bookish thing I did on my booktube channel. And it was really small. I mean, it wasn't anything big. And uh, and then people are like, wow, that's great. Like, but you said this in there. Tell me more about that. So then I made a second video. And on the booktube channel, I had 10 videos uh, that were, I called them uh, Sunday school, I think was my playlist. And I put them out on Sundays. And I was going to keep doing that. And I was like, no, I'll just make my own channel for it. And that's really how Mindshift started last year. And then uh, I had those videos. And so at first, like the first couple of weeks, you know, I did like these Tuesday takedowns. And then I was covering a book of the Bible. And that wasn't too hard. And then I had the Sunday video already prepped for my booktube channel. And so I was able to put out, and then I started doing like a Saturday short, like a little 10 minute. So I had four videos a week for like the first six weeks. And everyone was like, great upload schedule. This is amazing. So much content. I was like, it won't, it won't stay. Like, don't get excited. But I've gotten kind of not stuck because I love doing it. But every week I think this will be the week I only get out one video. And so far for nine months, I've kept up. But I'm waiting any week now for this to be the week where it's like, no, I have nothing left to say. I have nothing to react to. I don't have a Sunday topic. But by the skin no. of my teeth, something comes up, you know, every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday for me to get something out. So, again, well, I appreciate the love, but I don't know how long I'll be able to keep up that schedule. You've, you've got four, almost 40,000 subscribers now. I, I reckon you'll be way ahead of that. 
um, shortly because I think you you just you, the content you're producing is so consistent, so amazing. Do you? I have a quick technology problem that's not interesting to anyone but, but myself. But do you? Uh, do you have like a teleprompter or uh, anything that you that you like write your scripts write scripts on, or do you just like go off the cuff? I, I mainly go off the cuff. I I watched a video of someone doing a teleprompter and I thought, dang, that looks awesome. Like it's on the camera stand and it's it's right there and you can see it. It looks like you're looking at the camera. And I sat down one time to try to script an episode and it was it was horrible. Like n nothing comes like what happens is just the train of thought of me speaking. And then I just edit out all the crap. And so, you know, there's a lot of editing. It's not like I just perfectly diatribe for 40 minutes. It's a two hour video that gets cut down to 40 minutes because I do a tangent here and I hate that. Or I, I said that and that's not true when I went back and looked. And so it's it's more of a redacting process for me than it is like getting it right the first time. But I I do an outline sometime if I'm going to cover a lot of verses. Um, I have some episodes that are really verse heavy, like 50 verses, 200 verses, whatever, where I'm really making a case for something. And that I'll definitely like collect the verses ahead of time and make an outline. Um, but otherwise, no, I just try to pick a topic and and go. Oh, it's just it's really good. It's good stuff. Not to not to continue to insert explicit um, there, but, but yeah, really re really awesome, man. Um, back to what we were talking about, though. Uh, what were we talking about? And you mentioned your video. Um, oh, uh, it was just the local flood and and um, oh uh, yeah, problem with knowing about the rest of the world. <laughs> Well, this is something that this is something that I, I kind of wanted to touch on. It's um, it, it's you have actually forget that. I want to ask this question: um, What type of Christian were you? Were you the type of Christian that like did you speak in tongues? Did you do were you very Pentecostally? Did you have laying on of hands? Did you or were you more into the study of the, the Bible? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I've been I've been wanting to cover tongues so much in a video and I it's same thing as like demon possession, like these things that were such a huge part of my life or the culture around me that affected me so much. I've hesitated to make videos on yet because I want to do it perfect. I I want it to be like that 2 hour all encompassing let's get all the details out at once video. Mm -hmm. I struggled with tongues. I remember we called our um kids group like king's kids alive or something it was so stupid and down there in the at church and at like first grade they did the altar call and the kids thing to be baptized in the holy spirit by way of evidence of tongues and so i went down there and i did my thing and you know they ask you for the first time it's like such a pivotal moment you know like go ahead and you're supposed to as a seven-year-old speak in tongues or what you think is tongues and so i did it and it happened and, you know, and I came from the home where my mom, and this is looking back, it's not even biblically correct, but she would be speaking in tongues 24 seven. She'd be praying to God in tongues while she was washing the dishes and vacuuming and like whatever. I, so it wasn't, it wasn't scary to me and it wasn't obscene or weird, but when it came time for me to do it, I immediately had like this honesty check of is that me? And then the the feedback after that is horrible. You tell that to a pastor, and <laughs> this is the guy that just baptized you in the Holy Spirit. So it's it's kind of calling him a liar or that it didn't work, you know, if you are doubting that it was the Holy Spirit, because you shouldn't be doubting this. You should be convicted in this. And mm -hmm. the pushback I got from him in first grade during that particular experience probably scarred me and my speaking in tongues journey for the next 20 years, because I was always scared of offending God or being an imposter or being deceived by the devil, but also, according to what I believed, thought that was the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I, I did speak in tongues. I didn't ever really feel comfortable with it. And I can, I can hear like those Christians, ah, see, you were never a Christian. But it was the intellectual honesty that I think like actually, and it took 30 years to get to the point of saying, maybe that's because there isn't anything more than the psychological effect going on. So that was, that's a big issue for me. And there's so much more there to break down. Um, so that's the answer to tongues, but in general, everything else I was game for. I thought I healed people. I thought I got healed. I was prophesied over. I thought I was going to do great things. I thought I saw prophecies come true to me. My best friend had a series of prophecies that seemed to come true for everyone in his life, except for the one he made for me. But then it's like, man, it happened for everyone else. And, and it's, again, it's that, it's that weird doubt, or is it just me being more honest? And so, you know, that was a tug and pull with a lot of those kinds of gifts and signs and wonders and things like that. 
Um, and that's honestly what kind of led me to more of a progressive Christian Christianity other than young earth creation falling flat and evolution being true. Once I really wrap my head around both of those and then some of those more charismatic things I had always had issues with, it was like, oh, okay, this is clear. I've had the wrong version of this all along. And I whittled it down to what was more comfortable, more progressive, more natural, healthier, more loving, more about Jesus, more about the scripture, New Testament only. And um, and so, yeah, there was a real ebb and flow and, and evolution to my Christianity in that regard. That's a long answer, but there's a lot there. No, it was, do you, do you remember, did you have any fall, fallout when you did become a progressive Christian from uh, loved ones? So my mom's pretty full fledged. Um, but I think she even had issues. <laughs> the whiskey? No, specifically because I, um, I called her out on the tongue thing and I said, Hey, like from my understanding, it seems like someone needs to be able to interpret tongues for you to be doing this. And she was like, yeah, I actually, I, I've kind of been thinking that too. I've dialed it down. And then she was also a preacher. She was the missions director and she preached all the time. And I said, Hey, like, how do you feel about what Paul says? Uh, in second. <laughs> and so like, she knew, time. <laughs> she knew that I was like kind of leaving some of that more whatever, and, and really getting more to the scriptures and the text and like trying to understand things correctly instead of taking them at such face value. Um, so I didn't get a lot of pushback even from her, which would have been the biggest one. And then my group, I was kind of like, in some cases, the Christian leader. And so a lot of people kind of came with me in my journey out of fundamentalism where, uh, they just, they couldn't make excuses for what we were all learning about evolution either. And so we were all kind of like, it was almost like a rallying call for my group, uh, a really close group of us to be like, let's find the real answers. Like, let's find what was metaphor. Let's stop being these Christians that are so crazy uh, and driving people away. And, you know, let's be better examples of Christ. And, and so, yeah, that movement, I know a lot of people get pushed back when they leave fundamentalism. I was lucky to do it with a group, but then it made leaving that group that much harder because it's like, oh, Brandon, you took it too far. You know, yeah. everyone wants you to question and doubt because it's healthy and, and responsible and honest up to a point. And then if you cross whatever that tipping point is for them, oh, you've been deceived. You went too far. Like you lost, you lost the track here. So that's, you, that's more when all my pushback came. Do you remember what, what that was? Like, what was the, the moment that you were like, oh shit, this doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I, I don't know if, you know, I, I did a video the other day on deconstruction and I talked, someone had labeled, like done research on the five steps of deconverting and and one of, I think, step three was like a trigger. And I said that I don't think that's necessarily fair. I think it's more of a tipping point because it's such a collection of things. Like, yeah, there's definitely someone that has a trigger in their life. Their child dies and they're like, this God can't exist. And you could make excuses for that, but you can also understand it. Most people, though, who deconvert, I think it's a, it's a thousand things. It's a, before that final straw that breaks the camel's back. It is this tipping point of okay, I could make excuses for one, I could be okay not knowing for three, but now we're on 172 and I'm just out. I've, I've got no excuses left and there's so much counter evidence to the contrary. So the final thing I remember was I really, 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 really tried to get a final answer on the slavery issue. And it, it's not like I'm a one issue deconverter. It wasn't like, oh, I can't excuse slavery and therefore God's not real. No, oh, he could just be a God I disagree with, or there could be something I don't understand. But on top of everything else, with everything else I already had an issue with and could not explain, as soon as it became abundantly clear to me, and this is a hill I would die on, that 100% the God of the Bible condones and endorses chattel slavery. I see no way around it. I've never had a good argument against it. Um, I know the verse is too well. I was like, what am I to do? Like, okay, even if this God is real, this is unacceptable. Like, <laughs> I cannot make an excuse for this. So that wasn't the moment I deconverted or anything. But that was the realization for me where it was like, even if there is something out there, or even if some parts of this Bible are true, and we don't have to get into inerrancy or all of that, there's these character traits that seem to be inexcusable. And the more that these compiled, uh, 
it was like, yeah, they're, they're, it's going to fall apart. And then it kind of, it took the steam out of some of the other excuses I had held on to. Yeah. The slavery one's big, isn't it? It's, it's, um, but has anyone told you that the Israelite slavery was actually fun tickle time slavery where the master would treat their slave with respect and, you know, I go oh to work. Gosh. Lucky is them memory. getting to work off that debt in such oh. a healthy way. Oh my gosh! What, they were what else were they supposed like, to do? They were like lap dogs. Like how great <laughs> for them! Until you hear that, like they have a child. That child is born oh. into slavery, and <laughs> they have to pierce their ear and stay forever if they want a relationship with their child. It's like, oh yeah, maybe not so fun times. Um, it's unbelievable. <laughs> you know? Oh wow! That never. I, that never occurred. So I always knew that was quite brutal. And what you're talking about is Exodus 21. Is that is that correct? I'd it's have to look. Of, I'm not someone that yeah, always. But, I don't have the Rolodex, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, the, yeah. So essentially, can you explain that? Because that's always that's always hit me uh, one way. But now, just thinking about that, having a child, I actually think it's the was, most damning thing in the entire Bible that a child can be born into slavery in the Israelite tradition under God's laws, period. You know, that's the workaround is if you had an Israel, an Israelite indentured servant who you could beat and do all these horrible things to as long as they didn't lose a tooth or lose an arm or whatever the rules were, mm -hmm. if you wanted them to stay longer, you know, the workaround was, hey, get them married. And if they have a kid and or a spouse, they are now permanent indentured servants, if we're using the best terminology, which I think as soon as you add the word permanent, it becomes slave. But uh, the only way to stay with your family was to then choose, choose that, you know, this man gets to choose on year seven. Uh, no, I'll, I'll sign up for life here. And yeah. that's, that's my understanding. I, again, the verses I'm more comfortable with because it's the more damning case is the chattel slavery side with the nations around you buying slavery, buying slaves and passing them down as property and all of that. But I'm pretty sure I have all that correct. And I think that that's like, it's insane. Yeah. No, there's uh, it, it is very insane. I'm just trying to find this verse. Um, uh, Okay, here we go. If you buy a, um, a Hebrew servant, it uses the word servant in NIV. For sure. It's probably meant to be slave. Um, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he's a servant for you for six years, but in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free. Um, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. But if the master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. Uh, but if the servant declares, I love my master and I love my wife and children and do not want to go free, then the master must take him before the judges. He shall, ta um, he shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant slash slave for life. That excuse my French, it's fucking brutal. Yeah. But now having that perspective after having my kid, Atlas, having having Atlas, I, I would take that. Like, I, I think about this from a third party perspective. Like, okay, well, then you lose your family. That sucks. But if I was in this situation, I would opt to be with my family. I would opt to become this person's slave for life. Yeah. That's that's insane. That's That's disgusting. And even the verbiage, Again. they're like, oh, if you declare you love your spouse and you love your master, like this idea of it's it's the same thing to me as having to profess love for God, right? Like we're commanded to love God, uh, which is to obey him. That's how Jesus describes what loving him means, to obey me. So, you know, we have the same slave servant mentality, even as Christians with Jesus. We're commanded to love him. And that looks like servitude. And professing your love for your master so that you can stay with your wife and kid is such uh it's unto death false. as well yeah it's it's like the most abusive thing like hey bow down and kiss my feet if you want to keep your wife and you know look you wanted this you love me you wanted to mm -hmm. stay you chose to have your ear pierced you can go like the very fact that a child can be born into slavery and again you know i'm not a scholar in this regard maybe it was joshua bowen i, I i'm not sure someone was talking about 
there's good evidence to believe that that would have been a workaround within the Israelite community. I'm not sure what the evidence is. It's not a hill I would die on to purposely get your servants married um, and have them make children so that you could get free labor, you know, forever. I mean, it's, it's obviously even without having any proof that that would exist. Of course, people are going to manipulate the system. People are always looking for loopholes in laws. Like we know this, if that's mm -hmm. on the books, which you read it, it is what master out there wouldn't have been trying to do this. Think about how many Israelite children were born into slavery and then try to tell me this is a God that doesn't promote slavery. Like it's insane. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there is a, there is a piece of sophistry that's just passed around by apologists that says, well, this was Moses. Moses was kind of a bad dude sometimes. You know, he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. These aren't instructions from God. I've, I've heard that apologetic. But this is the same sophistry that's around, you know, the the contradictions between Matthew's genealogy and Luke's genealogy where they, they just don't line up. Luke will say Joseph's father is, right, or, or whatever it is, and they'll translate that to say, well, that's Mary's bloodline. Well, that's not what it says. And this is exactly what they're doing with this verse. This is Moses being a bad dude or Joshua or whoever being a bad dude who wrote this. But if you go, if you just read what it says, like at the start, it says, and then the Lord said to Moses, tell right. the Israelites this, and then keeps going. These are the laws you are to set before them. And then literally goes to, if you buy a servant, if you to buy a servant, a Hebrew servant, he must serve you for six years. So these are instructions. This is like, this is quoting God. If this was a red letter Bible or whatever the letter coloring would be for yeah. Yahweh, this would be colored in like instructions from God. And, and it's just this, it's this tap dance that apologists seem to do because they know it's immoral. They know it's wrong. And then in the other, in the next breath, they'll say they get the morality from the Bible. Right. And then they, but then they obviously don't because they're, they're, they're negotiating with the text because they know something inside them is like, ah, it's probably not good to own a little baby as property that you can pass on to your children as inheritance. That's probably not a good thing. So it's beyond frustrating. And obviously everyone can tell the whiskey's caught up with me. I'm now <laughs> ranting. <laughs> no, I love it. it. Because, you know, the other thing too is it's like God calls Moses out every single time Moses messed up. You know, it's not like Moses, first of all, we know Moses didn't write this book because it includes his death. But uh, furthermore, <laughs> we know yeah. just um, this is someone else writing about Moses. It's not like there's a bias coming from Moses. They're willing to call Moses out on behalf of God when Moses has done wrong. I mean, he's denied going into the promised land because of these sins. We know what God considered incorrect that Moses did. And of that list of things, it's never you gave the wrong commandment. In fact, <laughs> Moses is so scared about doing wrong to God that the one time that he told his soldiers, make sure you kill all the children during a battle and they didn't, you know, there's this epic verse, you'll, maybe we can find it or we'll just leave it to people to go find it. But he has all the young boys that were spared from the battle on the other side brought forward and has them all murdered because he's like, listen, this wasn't, this wasn't hyperbole. God meant kill them all. And it's the scene that is left out of every Exodus movie where Moses has all these little children lined up and murdered to make sure that he's pleasing God correctly because he knows what God said. And that's not called out <laughs> being disobedient. And it's like, if you're going to start down the path of making these kinds of apologetics where, oh, humans are fallible, humans can misrepresent God, okay, then we can't believe a word of the Bible. So we have nothing mm -hmm. to stand on. You cannot pick and choose here. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating to me. You just hit the nail like on the heads because it gets true. I, I kind of agree with Ken Ham when he says, oh, I never thought I'd say that. Yeah, um, right. But I kind of agree with Ken Ham that, you know, if you, if you then, if you take out, if you believe evolution and you take out Adam and Eve in Genesis, well, Jesus quoted Adam and Eve. Yeah. And, and, and not and, metaphorically. And so it, yeah, and how do you and how do you then reconcile, like what parts of the Bible to believe and what parts of the Bible not to believe? Now, I don't think that's a good reason to then therefore conclude that creationism is true because you're uh, engaging in motivated reasoning there. Sure, but I still think it's Stan, it's true. I still think that you can't like it's hard. I don't know how people just go. This part's metaphorical. This part's like like a joke. <laughs> You don't know how David, it's all about context. You just need to <laughs> know the original Hebrew and Greek and then you'll be fine. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired of it. And uh, and it's kind of what I said earlier, you know, 
the the people who again i don't like saying the words either fundamentalist like ken ham or hovinder whoever they all they all are taking the bible at face value and they're not picking and choosing like mm. and yeah they're if this god was correct they're definitely taking things that were obviously meant to be poetic you know and now i'm doing the same thing i'm saying well some parts are some parts are clear you know if when jesus says here's a parable cool that's a metaphor when Jesus says, truly, I tell you for the third time, he's not saying a parable. Like there are indicators in the Bible of what we should take seriously or literal and not. And when a prophet of the Old Testament who has been anointed and ordained by God says, here is what God is saying, it's typically not poetry. It's typically meaning God said this. And there's so many things that God said that represent his character by his word and then the follow-up actions that prove it wasn't a metaphor. Here's that thing God said being carried out, you know, in 17 different books of the Old Testament and 23 different iterations. And you can no longer make those kinds of excuses. Mm, mm. Uh, what's your favorite Bible verse? Well, I had many. Now or when I was a believer? Um. Now, what's your favorite Bible verse now? Um, it was a stupid question for me because one of my favorite verses is the same. Uh, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes, and I actually can't think of it right now, and it's, um, let your words be few. And I, I love Ecclesiastes in general, and it's hilarious because now all I do is talk about the Bible so much. But at the time, it was like a good kick in the butt for me to be like, hey, like, be a man of action, really represent this, stop, you know enjoying hearing yourself speak about like the goodness of God and just be the goodness of God. And that's not even what that verse means. That's the thing about being a Christian. You can just pluck a verse out and make it whatever you want. Like I recognize I wasn't keeping that verse in context. Um, but I still love that verse. It's, it's one of my tattoos. I have all Christian tattoos. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I I'm no longer interested in tattoos now that I'm not a Christian. So I'm stuck with all my Christian ones. Um, but my very first tattoo was Job 121, which is disgusting. It might be my my least favorite verse now. Uh, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, which is essentially a hall pass for God to do whatever <laughs> he wants, because I'm just his lowly servant, and who am I to question him? And if he wants to murder my whole family and take all my possessions, you know, that's his right. And I'm so lucky, and I'm so thankful. And I thought that was the height of wisdom. You know, just yeah. that, that's what we're told. There, the beginning of wisdom is to fear God. And not only fearing God in this sense of awe, but appreciating <clears throat> the suffering that he allows us to have. I mean, it's such a disgusting, it's 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 truly mentally harmful. And uh, I've got it right here. And uh, yeah, those were like the kinds of verses I loved. Big, bold, God is sovereign verses. I, I have a tattoo uh, that says, therefore, if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Mm. And in my mind, I'm like, one day I'll be free of my pornography addiction. Mm. I need to get rid of this pornography addiction. And that was like one of my, uh, I guess, uh, thorns in my side that, I, at the t uh, you know, as a Christian, I felt very conflicted about the cinema that I enjoyed uh, in my yeah. private time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's wild. I don't regret my tattoos. Like, actually, they they still tell like a story. Um, they're not they're sure not as cool as I remember, but um, <laughs> as I thought they did at the time. But I still you know, tell a story. It's funny that <clears throat> that you say that you actually gave up a really good answer to um, some of the you know that your favorite verse um, or verses when it, something that you mentioned at the start and I'm all over the place with this interview I apologize this is no, more of a conversation but but uh, something you said at the start is you, you your your favorite sin is blasphemy right I guess essentially like. Picking to be on God. fair, I've never thought about that question. That's like <laughs> no, 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 no. It's what just witty answer. What am I going to say? Like a, murder, but you know, like yeah. it's just a, it's just a fun sin. I mean, yeah. it's just a fun question. Sorry, uh, but something that is, is very interesting is I actually take a, a, an opposite approach. So I actually I actually think that the apologists are the one who one the apologists and the Christians are the one who are, who's, who are teasing God. So yeah. I build this like this this concept of a god in my in my head and i go okay if there is like hypothetically if there is an all-knowing all-loving all-powerful creator of the universe would they be described like would they tell us to own slaves would they not want to would they want to like kill witches you know would they you know hate homosexuals 
you know, would they cast unbelievers into a lake of fire? And I go, no. And I go, so, so anyone that's saying that that got that the creator of the universe would do that is the one that's teasing God. It's like, it's like uh if I go, oh, I know Brandon, you know, Brandon, and I start making up all these like rumors about you. It's like that's not that's not true. That's like that's like you're you're, you're now picking on <laughs> you're now picking on Brandon. Stop. So I'm I'm sitting here on deep drink saying, stop picking on God. It's not okay. Like it's if there is a God, you're saying some really horrible shit about this God because he most certainly isn't the God of the Quran or the Bible. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I was gonna say <laughs> if you're talking about the God of the Bible, then all they're doing is parroting him because he supposedly yeah. said these things by his word. But if you're talking about if there is a God that is higher than all of these man-made creations we've made, the real blasphemy is giving any attribution to a local man-made God, especially one that is so evil and horrendous. And yes, yeah. with that, I agree. But also, if there is a real God out there who's not any of these man-made gods, he obviously, it, she obviously is not trying to communicate with us or give us any message or define its mm -hmm. personality to us. So I don't know. Like I said, I think no matter what, it's a victimless crime because we either have a, a God that's unengaged or we have one of these gods that's just clearly not real. And how could you hurt how could you hurt God? And this this brings me to one of your videos and one of the subjects I wanted to kind of talk about, which is uh, I think it's your most recent one, questioning the unquestionable. And mm. no, it's not. It's the one on heaven. It was your mm. episode on heaven. And it, it kind of it, it kind of like is a similar like a similar thing in that how can you hurt a god like how can you offend or upset or make a god angry it, it, that just kind of shows that that god is not perfect that god is not whole he's he she it whatever is missing something it's like it needs to get its attention or something from something else it's like it's it's uh it's not whole like if if i'm having the best day ever and i'm super confident and someone says like dave your t-shirt sucks or you've got dumb hair i don't I'm not worried. Like, okay, cool, man. Or like someone I don't respect says something to me. I'm like, it's like arguing with, with uh, the writing on a bathroom wall. I don't care. Like, I'm not going to yeah, worry over this. But if I'm like really down and out and someone I care about says something, you know, it, 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 it hurts. And this is the same thing with um, with heaven. Is like you, you touched on, on the idea of heaven and maybe you can kind of ex explain it in a little bit more depth because I didn't look into it too much. But the heaven is like this constant worshiping of this creator, this like this, this admiration and this like, you know, expressing of love. Doesn't God have something to do? Like, it, it just seems like, like one, what is God getting out of this? If he's, if he's like at max, he's like max level, he's not getting any XP. You know what I mean? Like he's a, he's at a hundred points, you know, he's not, he's not getting anything from this. Right, like, he surely can't become more perfect. Yeah. He can't become more perfect. So I just don't understand like, what God's getting out of the transaction of like us worshiping forever and forever and forever. And I just don't understand like if that's even the concept that Christians have an, have a perspective on is, is heaven just worshiping all the time? Like what is heaven? Right. Uh, Which is hilarious. Cause as soon as I said what I don't like about heaven, all I got back is you can't know what heaven is. Well then what is everyone talking about? How come every yeah. Christian I know tells me exactly what heaven is going to be like? And also the Bible says some things about heaven. And my my video on heaven is probably my most like, um, you know, a lot of people who watch the channel, there are, of course, Christians and, and Christian trolls and things like that. But the heaven video brought out the most opinions from everyone, I think, because I made seven points and some of them are stronger than others. You know, it was kind of fill the idea of seven issues with heaven. Uh, obviously if there's a perfect God, can he create a heaven that's not boring? Sure. But I was talking more about like the philosophical concept of eternity. Like there's no chance for growth. We're perfect. We can't become more perfect. There's stagnation. Like these are issues. They're not the big issues. Uh, the two big issues are one that you pointed out, which is the concept of heaven for this God. Like how is this, how, how are you outside of space and time? You exist before and after, and you've been here, you know, just had, create a number, even though there is no number, trillions of years, and one day you wake up and decide to create these ridiculous primates that all they do is get it wrong and offend you. And even by your own word, they can never measure up. They're, they're, they simply have no chance. Even Adam and Eve had no chance. If they were created in a way where they could sin, period, they were created to be able to sin. So God made us totally fallible, but then he needs us. And he also needs us to create other Christians. Like, we are God's plan for spreading the word. That is the answer for divine hiddenness is I gave you what you needed as a starter kit, make the sourdough yourself, you know, and 
It's so interesting that this God needs worship, needs praise, wants to be with us forever to do, yeah, to do what? To, for what? And I think that some, <clears throat> some of those verses about all we'll do is worship are derived from, um, like Ezekiel talking about what the angels do. You know, there are there are particular angels that God created to do nothing but shout. You know, uh, Francesca Stravrakopoulin in her book, God and Anatomy, does a good job painting a picture when she gets to the anatomy of God's ears about how deafening heaven would be. Because really, when we read these verses in Hosea and Ezekiel, these cherubs and other angels that are flying around him saying, holy, 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 they're screaming it. It's deafening. And, um, and she has good verses to back this up. And you think about that. You think about this God sitting with his footstool on the Ark of the Covenant, hanging out in heaven, being upset, angry, hurt, petty, regretful, all of these emotions that he shouldn't have, needing us, the lowliest things he could have ever made. And at what point do you step back and zoom out and say, what? How? How is this the perfect plan of the most perfect being that has ever existed? How is my worship going to bring him anything at all? And if it can, which it can, according to the Bible, because when he doesn't have it, he gets pretty upset. Like, how obviously man-made. And I know that you can make apologetics about, well, you can't understand, and, and maybe God created this longing in himself so that we could have meaning. You can make all these excuses, but if you were just an alien and someone told you our God concept— of any of the gods on earth, but specifically Yahweh in this particular concept of eternity with him and worship and blessing and all of this, you would say, no, obviously a man made that. Obviously that's you guys. You know, even having streets of gold, uh, God wouldn't care about gold and we wouldn't care about gold when we're in heaven. Like that's because we thought it was rare. So we thought it was valuable. So we thought heaven's the most valuable. So it's going to be made entirely of gold. How obvious having mansions, how obvious never crying again, how obvious beating death, the biggest, scariest thing on earth, how obvious, like everything about the afterlife, even the bad part with hell is, you know, that ah, they better get theirs. They offended me. There better be a place where they go. That's different than where I go because I'm working hard to be the good one. It's, it's so man-made. And again, you can't, it's not a reason in and of itself to say this God doesn't exist, but it sure begins to pile evidence for why we already know the rest of the evidence is pointing to this being a man-made creation. That's my quick diatribe on it. And it wasn't so quick. Oh, so you just hit the nail on the head again. That's so good. Man, what do you think about... Um, what are the biggest problems do you think for the Christian God? Besides um, the stuff we've talked about. Yeah. If I had to put a top and I've wanted to do this, I've wanted to do one of those fun tier list of, of God issues, not even like arguments against God, you know, the Kalam versus this or that, but like, just like, what do we see as an issue? Uh, I, I brought it up earlier. I think the, the, um, exclusivity of the God, having a chosen people group, only revealing yourself in one time and place, smack dab in the middle of humanity. Um, you know, and, and some of the things that surround that, like you'll hear a really common Christian apologetic that's like, oh, Jesus came about the time of the Roman Empire so that we could have the infrastructure in place to, you know, start the missionary journeys and spread the good news of the gospel. And like, it's like, well, maybe God shouldn't have done the whole Tower of Babel thing. Like if, if you need to wait 2000 years of suffering of the Old Testament so that we've prepared the place enough for Jesus to like, first of all, wait another 2000 years and let's get video cameras. Like then you're golden. Like all of these things don't make any sense, but I'm on a diatribe. The, the inclusivity or exclusivity I think is one of the biggest ones. Um, hell is obviously totally unacceptable. Um, the excuses of universalism and annihilation, you know, Bart Ehrman has a great book kind of dismissing the concept of hell um, and why we can think of that as an after effect from Greek culture. And I understand that. There's also a lot of verses that just say burning forever, you know? So I don't, I don't know. I still am formulating an opinion there, but I think however you break down the afterlife concept is an issue for God. Divine hiddenness is up there for me. The problem of evil is completely unacceptable. And to, do, you know, the better term there is the problem of unnecessary suffering. Um, mm -hmm. need evil because we have free will, fine. You need a level of suffering, fine. But it is so obvious that we have an absolute unnecessary level of suffering. It's, it's beyond demonstrable. So those are, and then God's emotions. Honestly, you know, I, I did a video on that um, maybe a month ago. We should not have a God that is reactionary. 
that's not a perfect divine justice plan. We should not have a God that regretted making us and then chose to do it again, as we have in Genesis 6. We should not have a God that delights in destruction. I'm just quoting videos from myself now. But the, I make these videos because those are the biggest things to me. I would expect a perfect God who says he wants none to be lost to be kind of sad when some are lost. But I quoted 50 verses in that video of God, not his prophets, not his people, not an, not a man like Moses or David who had a mean streak, God himself laughing, scoffing, taking pleasure in destruction. Like, okay, if this God is real, I want nothing to do with him. Um, so I, I think those are some of the my main issues. What about you? Yeah. Um, slavery is a huge one. I think I, th I want to actually talk a little bit about this um, in, a, in a, like a longer form video. I might take a leaf out of your book and go and just like talk to the camera and, and just rant, but not rant. Do what you, you do. Your videos. I was going to say, you haven't made a video in like three or four months. I know you do these live ones and they're great, but man, I, I think it'd be great if you started making more, more videos. Yeah. To be honest, I've been working on this documentary for like six months. I'm still mm -hmm. in pre-production and it's like it's just a nightmare, but I've got some really cool guests and stuff and um. It's going to be big. It's, I'll tell you. I'll tell you some um, some stuff about it when we when we get off the live. But um, but but yeah, that that is the plan. I've just having a new newborn and just and everything. It's just been it's been like nuts with a uh, schedule. But yeah, it's something I want to do. But for me, like the God belief in general was like this. Um, was this like had many different like it's like a mega belief almost. It's like you know when one node goes down, when one thing falls, the other things can like take up the slack, and. Uh, the inherency of the Bible was a big one. Like, I just don't, I just didn't see how if you could, if you could, uh, if the Bible wasn't inerrant, I just had no way of working out what was true and what wasn't true. Yeah. So like, I, I just like, okay, so what, what parts are like, it almost made the Bible worthless in that way in, 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 the, in a factual sense. It was still maybe good for like spiritual or theological or kind of, like artsy reasons, like the art part of my brain where it's like, you know, but when you're trying to get to the facts, did God create the earth in seven days? Did Jesus rise from the dead? It became useless because I had no idea what was true and what was false. Um, when the Bible's inerrancy fell apart, the, uh, the Bible's morality, you know, take the virgin girls for yourself. That was a big one. Yeah. Um, slavery. That was a big one. Uh, when I started looking uh, at, um, well, the inerrancy I've, I've already mentioned, but yeah, they're, 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 they're some of the big ones. Like hell um, was a big one as well. Just, but yeah, I guess they're the main things for me. Um, a big one too was, uh, is misogyny and yeah. LGBT issues. So like, and th this falls under morality, but, but like, I remember reading a scripture that says like women aren't to speak in church, you know, but Paul, you mentioned before and reading it to a pastor and being like, you know, well, not pastor, but uh, the kid's pastor. She was a woman. And, and I said, you know, what does this mean? Like, like what? It, like, And they said, well, that was for a time. You know, like women were separated on, the, and they would lean across the aisle and they would disrupt the service at the time. And I'm like, okay, all right. And I was like, so another time I had a, he's still a good friend. Um, first guest on Deep Drinks, Colin was a closeted homosexual. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was, you know, 45 years, never had a date or anything and met him in ministry college. And I said, so, you know, back then homosexual homosexuality wasn't seen as a, um, like a, 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 uh, a identity. It was seen as like something you did like an act. And I said, so could, could those verses about homosexuality just be for a time? Right. Like, yeah, of course. No, no consistency. That, no, yeah. That, that, because those are a moral issue. Yeah. Is it why is, I said, why is the women not talk, talking in church a moral issue? And then what's even worse is I, I then continue to read on in those verses and it gives the reasoning. It doesn't say because this is the time and people are talking across the aisle. It says because Eve was deceived first. Right. Yes. You're like, but wait, that's still true today. Eve was still deceived first today yeah. because. And so when I realized that uh, we were kind of bending the rules, well, first of all, I realized I don't agree with the Bible. And when I realized I didn't agree with the Bible, I was like, okay, I need to either correct my perspective or I need to find another perspective for the Bible because I'm disagreeing with God here. And the other thing was like, wait, how, how come, come we can bend the rules for some people, but then for other people we can't. And the people we're not bending the rules for, like the like folks in the LGBT community are like at a heightened risk for things like um, 
depression, anxiety, suicide, things like that. And I was like, this is this is so fucked up. Like that that the, the, these groups of people are just getting ostracized by people that like are reading this text that have no I no care for what it's actually trying to say or maybe they do but they they bend things in other directions so yeah that that's the big. thing you know it's you have 800,000 words and you have it saying so many contracting things that all in my opinion the only thing that has ever happened is whatever stage of morality our current society is in is how we interpret the bible and we're seeing it now even with and it's interesting. So like the uh, the gay community has really tried the Christian gay community to excuse kind of like what happened with women. You know, here comes the women's suffrage movement in the 20s and 30s. And all of a sudden we're OK with accepting Second Tim Timothy as a forgery or we're OK with saying it was just to that specific church. You have to understand the context because we're seeing women as equal. And so now we need our Bible to see women as equal. And now that society at large is getting more okay with homosexuality, we're seeing that same thing start to happen. And I guarantee you 50 years from now, pick a number, there will be as okay as we are with women preaching, there will be Christians being okay with homosexuality. And because you can, you can still pull things out. Same thing with slavery. Like a couple hundred years ago, let's use the Bible to promote slavery here in America. Fast forward, everyone's morality is slavery bad, oh, indentured servitude arguments. And so, hmm. you know, that's the problem with a Bible that is so vague and contradictory is you really can map it on to whatever you need it to say. And I think it's just hilarious, all the excuses you mentioned, and it's not even all of them. You know, again, I've heard, as soon as you break it down for everyone, well, he says it's because of the woman with Eve. And so you can't make the local excuse. And the moral excuse that you brought up there's actually Christians in my comment section that have said, well, we know 2 Timothy is a forgery. What? You're okay with something that's been canon for, I don't know, 1,200 years being, finding out that it's a forgery, and you're, you're, you're okay with that. Like, we have based, there's a lot of other stuff in 2 Timothy besides how we should treat Wait, women. Was, was, sorry, is 2 Timothy not canon? It hasn't been canon, wasn't it originally canonized in 300 something or? Yeah, so longer. My math is bad. Today. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, it's, yeah, it's sorry. only been canon like, for a very, very long time since like the original yeah. councils, right? Um, that's quick math on whiskey. But <laughs> my, my point is, is like we have a good group of Christians today that because of there's so many issues in particular books and because of what the scholarship has been able to point to, I think there's six pseudo Pauline books, Second Timothy being one of them, where we know it's a forgery that was associated to Paul for clout. How can you be a Christian and be okay with that and trust any part of the Bible but you can't be a Christian who's honest about your views on women and not wanting this God to not be a misogynist and allow Second Timothy. So you you just get, this is what I mean. I'm so hopeful that as this progresses, I see it going one of two ways. We either continue to make the same excuse game and the adjustment to our cur current moral standards, or we run out of rope finally. And I do think in some regards, we're close to running out of rope where it's such common knowledge thanks to the internet some of these issues like the forgery of the pauline epistles that you have to take a stand at some point of this bible is nowhere near inerrant it can't be and thus i now have trust issues and i have good reason to speak out against the validity of the bible or mm -hmm. you have to accept some things that our modern morals say are unacceptable like the disparaging of women you you it, you have to fall on one of those two sides in this particular issue and there's thousands of issues like this. And so I think that it's going to lead to a, a pretty big tipping point of we're going to go into another dark age of putting our head in the sand and it's just going to, we're going to accept everything in this Bible again for a long time, or it's going to be so irreconcilable eventually as the knowledge gets out there and more scholarship gets out there that hopefully it, it breaks the camel's back finally. I don't know. It's got to go one of two ways. I think we got away for so long in human history where so little people could read and have access to the information and the issues with the Bible that we couldn't have this. And just having the internet around for like 20, 25 years of this kind of apologetic and conversations, look what it's done, you know? Um, it's amazing. So I think, you know, exponentially, it's it's just going to drop off. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely will. I think um, Australia is just past, like, I think there are more atheists now than uh, specific groups of... Christians. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that 
happened because of the same-sex marriage plebiscite like that really like pissed off a lot of people and people on the fence saying they were kind of christian but not got pushed to one side sure um with how much hate the church was kind of spewing out um but uh before you said you know why invent the tower of babel why make it so rome you know we, Jesus came around the Roman period. I have like a better solution for an all powerful, all knowing creator of the universe. The same way babies know how to breathe when they're born or pump blood or reach for something. Um, why don't we just, why aren't we just born with the full knowledge of God? Like what, what would that change? It wouldn't change free will. Like, remember the devil and one third of his angels had full knowledge. Though He wasn't Satan, like the worship leader in heaven, probably right. playing christian rock but like you know now he plays heavy metal right but but um but like he had full knowledge of god and one third of the angels and apparently still could deny god so i just don't understand why guys god is hiding why we need to find him why we need to translate the english bible to say the exact opposite of what it says in plain reading when i talk to an apologist and go Hey, um, you know, it's Jesus kind of told his disciples that he would return within a generation. I tell you the truth, this generation shall not pass until they see all these things happen. And they go, ha, 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 David, David, David. Don't you know that that word generation means race and really is talking about the Jewish people as a whole? Well, then why does the Bible say that in English? Why do I have to, like, put the pieces of the puzzle together like some, like, cosmic jigsaw to yeah. work out what God's trying to say here? Why did the English Bible translators translate it as generation in every single Bible and not just race of people? And yeah. what's the purpose of Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, the Jews will be around till the end. Like, what does that mean? What, what does that even mean? Like, okay, so so he's just telling them that, like, I just, I just don't understand. It's just, it's just, it's just silly. And it, it's... I'm diatribing, but it's it's silly, and um, and I just think like, why is it so hard to understand the mind of God? Why can't we just be born with that knowledge? It would yeah. solve so many issues. I so agree, and it's it's not even the angels because then we, it's funny. I I'm sure I don't expect that everyone has seen like the two three the full three and a half hours that just happened on the line with me and Matt, but we had a caller that went down this line of that we do lose free will when we when we see God or have perfect evidence of him. And we started at the angels and then we went to Adam and Eve and he said, well, that doesn't count either because, you know, that's pre-fall. But Adam and Eve were also around after the fall. Um, and then Cain, Cain had direct conversations with God and that was after the fall, a generation after the fall. So what's your excuse there? And, you know, going all the way through to the prophets, um, Moses seeing God face to face, Abraham, Jacob or Israel wrestling with God. Uh, even into the New Testament, Judas being on a, a disciple of Jesus, following him around, seeing these things firsthand and still choosing to betray him in the greatest way possible, not just apathy or agnosticism, betraying the savior of, of the world, the son of God. Like you cannot make the excuse any longer that evidence of God takes away our free will. When the patriarchs of the Bible or in not always patriarchs, but some of the most prominent members of the Bible have seen God closer than any of us ever could, even with an ingrained knowledge of him uh, as an instinct. It's it's the stupidest excuse, the free will thing, but it's also the hardest one to fight. It is the hill that they all die on. They're, they just, they cannot wrap their heads around it. And it, But the, there's too many examples in the Bible. Like, I didn't even list them all. There are so many examples in the Bible. I mean, imagine being an Israelite camped around Sinai for, I forget how long it was, but it was a good amount of time. And you're seeing every single day, God in a pillar of cloud. And every single night you see the raging fire outside the tent entrance. And you see Moses's physical formation changed when he comes down from the mountain. And you see the ground open up to swallow up that like, you cannot have this existence and continue to, and, and by the way, arguably the worst people in the Bible, this particular first generation group of Israelites that rejects God over and over and over, that worships false idol after false idol after false idol, that continues to pick up sticks on Sundays or Saturdays. Like you cannot have this generation who knows God so intimately, who was brought out of slavery by him, who rejected him and then say, well, if we knew about him, we, we, it, would, it would ruin our free will. 
what are you talking about? Nothing could yeah. fall flatter. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's a huge one. Mental, it's like the mental gymnastics sophistry. It's just, oof, uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you've you done the very smart thing and stayed off, um, stayed off social media. Well, at least you don't have social media at the moment. But uh, let me tell you, Whew, there's a, there's a few apologists on Twitter that really like they 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 say things that um, deliberately trigger everyone, and it's sometimes so triggering it's funny. Uh, but you know, to this morning, and maybe you can touch a little bit on this. Um, let me just see. Hopefully, I'll go to Twitter and it won't bring up anything inappropriate. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a bit of a gamble. <laughs> it really is. Uh, let me just. But um, one of the one of the amazing folks that I talk I like to talk about all the time, uh, Cameron Batuzzi of Capturing Christianity, he stated, "To prove oh. that people on the internet will argue about literally anything, here's a picture of a metaphysically necessary truth: everything that exists that begins to exist has a cause." And I said, "Begins to" is slipped in in there because it would refute God sophistry. Right. Yeah, because Perfect. like you, you, you wouldn't naturally you don't naturally write everything that begins to exist has a cause. You say everything that exists has a cause. That's what you naturally say, but that doesn't work uh, because that takes out God. What are your thoughts on like an argument like that? Like everything that begins to exist has a cause. Like some of these are like, classic. Yeah, it's it's special cause. pleading to the highest degree, which you pointed out. You're changing even the verbiage of the argument to make an exception for the thing that's already an exception. Our God is outside of space and time. Oh, then that's the same thing as nothing. The same thing as nothing. It also means he can't. It all. It also means he can't be impactful in this world, because as soon as he interacts or interferes with this world, we can we can see that we can measure that difference. You know, when God killed of his own volition and action, no soldiers needed. When he throws stones down from heaven to help out, oh, I forget which prophet it was. Who was the really scared meek? weak guy um why can i not think of this name this is going to just drive it's the, me nuts. it's the scotch uh, yeah we'll blame it on that um my <laughs> recall this is like i told you this is one of those times in the video where i'm over here googling and then i look so smooth like oh brandon has a perfect memory um so i'm giving <laughs> myself away here but you know when god throws down a rock from heaven he's no longer outside of space and time when he takes a life on purpose to help his army get a victory, when he sends a deceiving spirit, when he confuses everyone and makes them blind so that they can't win their battle, like all of these times that God interacts, even sending Jesus, guess what? God's no longer outside of space and time. If he is there, he has to stay there. The second he interacts, you can't do this anymore. And so again, I, I think that those arguments, the fallacy is of course special pleading because you can do the same thing with any other term. You can do the same thing with the universe. You know, this is the whole conversation with infinite regress and did the universe come from nothing and all of these straw men that they try to put in the mouth of an atheist. And I'm no expert, but um, I do know that whatever you can say about God, you could just say about the universe and you've made it one order of complexity less. So if you're talking about Occam's razor, if you really want to be logical, like then be logical. We know we can follow a timeline, 13.8 billion years. We don't know what happened before that, if there's a before that. We don't know if universes beget universes. If this is some kind of a cycle, we can only measure to a point. And after that, the honest thing to say is, I don't know. If you're going to make the argument that it had to come from something, then so does God. Well, not God. He's outside of that. Why? And there is no why, except that you want him to be the first cause, because that answers your weird, creepy little apologetic tactic. And it simply doesn't work. Um, I, I think they get the most attention because you can dress them up like the, you know, William Lane Craig's Kalam is, it's simple with its premises, but when you actually hear him explain it, he's using so many philosophical terms and, and really impressive language that you feel like, how do I, how do I fight this? How, how can I break this down? But all he is saying is my God is the one exception. And it's like, mm. <laughs> that's not an answer. That doesn't answer anything. And I actually saw that one. I, I don't have Twitter or Facebook or anything, but I saw that because Cameron posted it on his community board on YouTube. And um, I didn't react to it because I don't want to go crazy every day. But I thought, <laughs> how, how disingenuous to not post the argument in full, to not 
to not uh, be correct with the verbiage, you know, to, to even do it in a way to like rile people up. Like, what's your point? How is this God's love? What are you doing here? It just, it's all so disingenuous to me that um, I think I don't have this burden. As an atheist content creator, I don't owe God anything. But if you're a Christian apologist or a content creator for God, do you not really need to check yourself on if you're doing more for the kingdom than less and how you're utilizing your time and what you're doing with your ad revenue? Like, And I, I know that's an unfair position for me who isn't held to the same standard, but I think it's insane what a, and I don't know Cameron, and I, I'm i not saying anything about him in particular, but as a sounding board here, really, or a jumping off point of how do any of these apologists justify these quips, these riling up atheists? The, you know, he said other things that are, are downright just horrible about atheists. And like First Peter says to give a kind account. Is this you giving a kind account? Is this you showing God's love? I just, I think that they... The fact that they're not held to this higher standard or that they don't hold themselves to it or that people don't expect Christians don't expect it is another problem within itself. We do not see lives changed. We do not see a peace that surpasses understanding. My Christian commenters are the, the some of the nastiest things I've ever heard. And yes, other Christians would say they don't represent anyone. But if if they have the light of Christ in them, should they ever even be able to type these things? I It just blows my mind. At what point do you say, there is a standard of what it should look like to be a Christian, and we simply don't see it. And I just went somewhere completely different than you were going with a Kalam argument or a first cause no, argument. But that's it all ties together because I see those posts all the time, and it's like, what are you doing? How like I have yeah. a higher standard for how I conduct myself online than this. What what is going on? Yeah, I, I was arguing. Then this is my fault. I shouldn't argue with people on Twitter, and I don't know why I did, but um. I don't know why I do, actually. I really don't know why I do because I've, like, made promises myself I'm going to stop arguing with people on, on Twitter. I even messaged, I even emailed Cameron and said, hey, I'm sorry if I've ever been rude to you on Twitter. Nice. I'm going to try my hardest to be, just address the arguments, not, not not you. And I messaged a bunch of other apologists as well and said, look, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. Just address the arguments. I don't want to be, like, that bitter, angry atheist. Yeah. Um, even though internally it drives me insane. Um, <laughs> but the... Yeah, I don't know why I was arguing with this, but this like one Christian was like literally calling me a dumbass and um and stuff like that. And I was like, do you? And I was like, what gospel are you reading? I was like, because I I like know the gospel where it says like to turn the other cheek. And he's like, what? Christians just supposed to bend over and take it? And I'm like, yes, explicitly yes. <laughs> like I'm, I read the gospels where like who was it? Uh, Stephen was like stoned. Or one of them was like stoned and then celebrated the fact. I think it was Acts, celebrated the fact that he was like worthy of being persecuted for Christ. Yeah. I read the gospel that says, turn the other cheek. You know, when, and when so I, I read the gospel that says, I read the Bible that says, pray for those who persecute you. I, you know, like I, I just, I just don't get this perspective where it's like, what are we supposed to just, we're supposed to just like let, let people just rip on us? It's like, yes, exactly. A hundred percent is like a hundred percent. I just don't, I just don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. And, and I, I feel for them because in in some part it's like aside from their religion they would almost be correct like it's a you know if I say something foolish I'm a fool but Christians aren't allowed to call someone a fool you know it's right there in Matthew like and I can't and it's even funny to me how many Christians actually use that word fool with me it's like call me <laughs> an idiot but you're actually doing the thing new testament in context Jesus yeah. himself is saying not to do. And the punishment, by the way, the second part of that verse, and I, I don't want to overspeak because I can't recall right now. I'm pretty sure it's like hell, right? You'll be in danger of the fires of hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's hilarious to me how much they don't <laughs> take this seriously to an extent. And again, not all Christians. Obviously, there's Christians living really wonderful lives and trying to be as Christ-like as possible. And we're hearing from probably a silent majority. So I want to be as fair as possible. But the fact that anyone could actually say the sinner's prayer, or go to church and read their Bible and profess a belief in Jesus Christ, and then not represent anything of what we're supposed to see from the witness of the Holy Spirit that has come upon them, it's fascinating to me, because it's 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 proof. Like, I don't want to be the person that says, if you don't act like a Christian, you're not a Christian. But the very fact yeah, that Christians can act non-Christian is unbiblical. Where is the new creation? Where is the peace that surpasses it all? Like, it's at some point you have to say, 
the promises that were made to what would happen to you internally as a believer with the witness of the Holy Spirit, they're simply not true. And this is something that I've been building a lot more of a case around in my more recent videos. And I'm going to be making a big video as kind of a challenge. I've been told, I, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've been trying to bring all my comments and I like data. And I'm gathering how many times since I started my channel, a Christian in all sincerity has said, I'm praying for you. And right now I'm somewhere around like 1300 good meaning Christians with the witness of the Holy Spirit have promised that they're indeed praying for me, yet alone everyone in my life, yet alone, you know, everything else, thousands of people. So they're meeting all the criteria. This is God's will. He doesn't want me to be lost. I'm, this is the video I'm putting out. I'm already ruining it. Seeing it live here on Deep Drinks. The, but they're meeting all the criteria. Two or three are gathered. How about 2,000? Okay, that should be good for God, right? In terms of how we should pray. Praying in his will, because we don't want to pray outside his will. Jesus says at least three times he wishes for none to be lost. That's me. He doesn't want me to be lost. They're praying sincerely. They're praying often without ceasing. All the things they're telling me they're doing, and here I am. So either every single one of them is a liar, and they're not actually praying, issue, or God <laughs> isn't doing what he said, issue. There is no getting around it. We have clear verses about the power of prayer, ask and receive. I've put all these verses on prayer together, making sure that you meet each of them, because sometimes they have different requirements for what you would expect. But it's that simple, and here I am. Like, what, what is their answer to this? I should be saved. There's, there's no getting around it. So it's that kind of thing, again, with the peace that Christians should have with the witness of the Holy Spirit, where we don't have 30,000 denominations. You simply refute the Bible itself when you look at the hard data. And that's like my new favorite way of, of attacking <laughs> some of these issues. You just hit so many, oh, so many, so many like things I want to comment on. Uh, first of all, that's amazing that you <laughs> compiling data on how many people are praying for you. I, I remember I went onto a Discord once, and I was I, I uh, it was a Christian Discord that I got invited to. So I, I came along, and I said, "Hey!" I went to the chat and I said, "Hey, I'm going to be in the voice room, and I'm I'm an atheist. If anyone wants to ask me questions about why I don't believe in God, you're welcome to come along." And um, turns out, like it was only pretty much atheists in the room because mm -hmm. they all got invited to this Christian channel as well. And we're just waiting for a Christian to rock up. And then this Christian lady rocks up. And then, like, I just kept using the Socratic method and asking questions. And it got to the point where they were, like, essentially screaming at me. And it's on my other YouTube channel somewhere. But what's funny is at the end, they were saying that they'll pray for me. And I'll know that God is real because, like, of the experience that I'm going to have. And I said, I said awesome. Like, I was like, great. And I actually said, I'm going to put this in my calendar. I said, how long do you need? For this miracle to happen because she said yeah. soon and i said how long do you need for this miracle to happen that'll convince me because if it does convince me great like i if there is a god i want to know about it you know what i mean like i don't want to like if the earth is flat i want to know about it tell me the evidence you know this is like my my take on of all these things uh anyway i put in the um i put it in my calendar for a year's time i said sure i get a year a year for this miracle for this thing to happen it's going to happen soon so a year is way more than like it needs to be and I went to, and then I got this like thing, message that person and tell them if the prayer worked like a year later. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, I'm blocked. I'm like, I got oh. blocked. Like, so <laughs> damn, no damn way. Like, like that's a hilarious example, but the, the follow through is like the biggest issue. Every altar call, you know, Hey, here's all the promises we made when the emotional music was playing about what is going to happen in your life as soon as you accept Christ as savior. And first of all, that's already flawed. Like Christ says, you're going to suffer for him. All this prosperity stuff is ridiculous, but even like inner peace and the, the ability to be strong in your faith through the, the witness of the Holy spirit. Like there are some things that even are biblical that are promised in these kinds of altar call settings. And I just like, where's the church's responsibility of following up with these people? Now, some churches I know do, there are discipleship classes. They have, you know, check-ins where they call these people two or three times. They don't answer. Then, you know, they drop off at some point, but it is absolutely astounding to me that you can stand on a pulpit every Sunday, make these kinds of amazing claims, insane, miraculous level claims about what will happen with people. Same thing with healings, demonic possession, all of these things. Who follows up with that person a month later when they're in the exact same spot? Do we, you know, when, when the person is relieved of that demon and you see the amazing YouTube video, where is the video a month later? They're probably still in abject poverty or have the same mental illness 
haven't gotten help because their actual need is medication or whatever the case is. And it's like, stop showing the highlight and show the reality. The, the follow-up is just horrendous. And, and that's a perfect example. A Christian just, they can say anything and it sounds good. And they, they even probably convince themselves. Like I'm, I pray and I believe God will do this, but I have no responsibility after this. I'm a seed planter. I was told to, mm. you know, if the town doesn't accept me, move on to the next one. And it's this entire concept of no responsibility. And it, it blows my mind. It really, really mm. does. Yeah. And, uh, what you're saying it's funny that you said the um the people calling you foolish or calling you idiots and like before what, what you're saying because uh i remember arguing with a street preacher who came up to me and i i politely asked twice i'm not comfortable having this conversation i'm going to keep going and they said they just kept going so, so, so i sort of took off the i took off the kid gloves and i said can i ask you i even asked permission can i ask you some tough questions about your faith sure okay all right well how do you reconcile slavery what do you mean? And then I showed him the verses and et cetera. And it got to the point where I said, um, um, you know, after the big ramble about, you know, it was for the time of stuff, I said, okay, so is it a sin to own another human being as property? And uh, they go, oh, I'm not going to even answer such a foolish question. And I said, ooh, I said, be careful now. I was like, you, if you call me a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And they go, I didn't say you're a fool. I said that question was foolish. And I was like, yeah, but you're kind of like, we're, we're, we're kind of splitting splitting hairs here, aren't we? Like you're, you're, you're saying that what I'm saying is foolish. I was like, you can't answer that question. Anyway, the the uh, the lovely engagement ended with me going, look, I'm going to leave. Here are your pamphlets. I'm not going to read them. Um, you got to read them. I'm not going to read them. Take them. I don't want you to have to spend more money on printing. And as I was walking off, they're screaming, God's going to harden your heart. And I'm saying, he must have already done it. So, right. you know, like, <laughs> so. And how, yeah, how could uh, you be okay with that apologetic either? So this person was God's vessel here on earth. They're how, obviously, they put you in his path. Uh, it, it was on their heart to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. And because you didn't accept their horrible attempt, where they obviously weren't having the words of the Holy Spirit coming through them, um, as they're doing things clearly against the Bible, their belief is that God is now going to punish you, not them for this interaction. And he's going to punish you in what way? Making you less receptive to his word, to his outreach toward you, to the thing mm -hmm. where he says he wants you to be safe. Like in what world does any of that work on any level? And yet I, I, I get the same thing daily in the comments, like, oh, you've been deceived. Why are you okay with that? Why are you okay mm. with the fact that I, who earnestly sought for 30 years, have reached a point where only because of intellectual honesty and study of the word of God have reached a point where I simply am not convinced. I don't hate him. I'm not wanting to sin. I simply am unconvinced, even though I tried for 30 years of my life. You're okay with the response to that earnest sincerity being deception, where I can't come back, where I'll never know if I'm wrong again. Like, make it make sense. I just, it's, it's mm. unbelievable to me that, and there is no good response, right? Uh, but this is also what the Bible says, that there are people who will not be rich. There are people that the devil gets a hold of. That's why we need the, it's, it's the biggest catch 22 in the world. We need the witness of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the Bible, but we're supposed to use the Bible to even come to an understanding of Jesus. And then we're supposed to use the armor of God to protect ourselves against deception. So if you were a Christian and you fall away, you were never really a Christian. Otherwise, you would have had the armor of God to protect yourself from that deception. But if you get deceived before you can find the Holy Spirit, before you can read the Bible, then you have no hope of letting the Bible work in your life because apparently God, who is all powerful, can't get past you know, what the devil is doing. And it's like, at what point do you just step back and say, look how ridiculous. This doesn't work. Mm. You can't win. Like, and and that's why Calvinists rule, right? Like because at least <laughs> admit you're screwed, man. More part of this black sucks for you. You know your suffering is going to be good stuff. I'm going to smoke on that glory up in heaven. It's unbelievable. I've said that word so many times. It it truly is. And you're asking yeah. like at the beginning of the conversation, what's the thing? It wasn't just slavery. It was all of this kind of stuff put together. Yeah. It's like you cannot excuse it all. It simply doesn't work. This God either is the worst God imaginable or he's not real. And uh, anyone who's, who tries to make a case for this loving father with even, even just what I just said in the last minute, let alone everything else, it's, it's mm -hmm. impossible. 
you know, this kind of con conversation reminds me of some of the conversations I've had when I've had a bunch of whiskey with a, a friend of mine. We like, there's been times when we get so worked up that we're actually get up, stand up and like pace around the room. Like this is like, we're getting like really like passionate. So I appreciate this. Yeah, uh, this for is, sure. This is very real. And but tomorrow yeah, we'll both get told how we're just hurt Christians. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Uh, so just before we jump into um, some super chats wrapping up and, and I've got a couple of last questions for you, I'll just quickly finish that, that I'll not, 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 not finish, but um, uh, amend or tell the story of the start of that, because I think it's a really good question to ask if someone does come up to you with evidence for Jesus Christ or, or any type of religion. So th this lady that came up to me that, that had these like tough questions or not these tough questions that I, that, that called me foolish or said my questions were foolish. I was walking back from the shops and I was had my shopping with me, like I bought a scale or something and I was walking and she runs, runs up to me. I thought she was like panicking or she needed something. And she goes, Oh, I was anorexic. God saved me. And then started telling me her story about like how she went to doctors and she couldn't get her eating disorder corrected. And, and, uh, and then eventually she went to a, a church service and she got prayed for and she felt the power of God and it healed her and stuff. And uh, after I said, look, I'm not comfortable having this conversation twice and she kept going, I just listened to what she had to say. And I think this is a good, a good way to engage with, um, with uh, religious folks that are proselytizing. You let them kind of like talk for a little while if, if you if you got the patience for it. Uh, and this is the question I asked. And it was something I took out of um, my time doing street epistemology or at least online epistemology, the, the SE kind of stuff. And I just asked her this. I said, and I said, so... I said, you've, you've given me all this, these reasons to believe or to at least come to a church service for your God, uh, so for, for Jesus. And I said, do you mind if I do, I got permission again. Do you mind if I ask you a question about that? Sure. I said, well, I said, let's say that we're having this conversation about Jesus and someone comes up to us and starts telling their story. And it's very similar to your story. Let's say it's almost exactly the same as your story, but they were healed because they prayed to Buddha or Allah or a Hindu God. Uh, Shiva, Krishna, doesn't matter. Um, Native American religions, paganism. I said, would that, would that be evidence to believe in their God? And she was like, no, no, it wouldn't be evidence. I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, you know, she got like really flustered at this point. And I said, okay. So, and after she would rant about how Buddha did nothing for nobody and, and everything <laughs> did nothing for nobody and stuff like that. I go, okay. So I said, if it wasn't evidence for their God, I said, why would it be evidence for your God? And I think that was one of the, when she got like really, really flipped and started saying like, God is, you know, going to harden your heart and, and everything like that. But I think just asking that, that simple question of like, okay, so the evidence are you giving me? Or like, let's say someone comes to you with the evidence from the Bible or evidence. Okay. Does that work for another God? And does, and if they say yes, then you can, so what, what, what's different about your God? And if they say no, you can ask, continue to ask them questions. Like, why not? Um, so yeah, I just, I think that's, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's fantastic. And it actually does spark my mind back to like your original questions of like tipping points or triggers for me. It was an idea of comparative religion, but not just comparative religion to see how similar all the claims of religion are, but comparative mm -hmm. religious experience. Like it's like you, there is a narcissism within any religion where you're housed in it. Uh, but specifically within Christianity where it's like, it has to be. My God is the only God that can create this experience. These psychological phenomenon that I'm experiencing is only because of the Holy Spirit. Like you can't get this with another God. And when I became convinced that these other people that had religious experiences under different religions or God concepts were as equally sincere as I was, it immediately, if you're honest, puts you in a position where you're like, hey, <laughs> maybe it's a human thing you know, instead of maybe it's a God thing. If we're all capable of having these religious experiences, and a lot of people hate like the new atheist, but it was Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, that was one of the first times where I realized like, oh, spiritual experience is a human phenomenon and it's explained in the brain and here's how, and we're all just acting it out in different ways with different stories. And it was such a huge understanding for me because that excuse of, but not, you don't know my personal relationship with Jesus that I told you about earlier as like my main fallback, it gets eradicated as soon as you understand anyone can create this with anything. Five-year-olds do it with imaginary friends. But then that same parent that sees their five-year-old do this with an imaginary friend will hear their five-year-old talk about what Jesus told them. They're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're revealing yourself to my kid. And it's like, he's capable of believing anything. Like, 
Mm-hmm. And, and we're the same as adults. Like it just, it takes that specialness out when you really understand the human condition. So that's something else that I think, yeah. And your, your question points to that for her. And the initial response is usually very guarded, but hopefully it does make people think it made me think and eventually kind of helped me deconvert. So yeah. Interesting. Well, I've got a, I got a few, we've got a few super chats and, um, uh, and I know that we've gone over time, so I'm going to try and get to them quickly. Sure. But one, one of the things uh, I wanted to kind of bring up is I found your Goodreads account and I'd mentioned this before we started and I want to just quickly compare some books and I want to get a, a, uh, I want to get a recommendation from you, but I don't want like an atheist book or some book on like, I want like a novel. I want something that I'm going to like, that's going to change my world okay. in a way that, don't just don't just pick like you know some like the god delusion or something just give me something that 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 you, but i'm going to show you the list first okay so this okay. is our combined um list so the only two books that we agree on that are five out of five is sapiens and stoner and but but i will say that that stoner for me uh oh sorry that five star reviews for me i've only got like nine they're like that's like that has to change my life in some way like okay. it has to be like that yeah. important so i'm like very i've only got a few five star reviews but i do a lot of five star reviews because i need it to be 10 stars and so if it's five like four wasn't good enough this book was a yeah. 4.2 so it went to five so yeah, yeah. that's th- it's hard because that's actually it's 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 kind of different philosophies in in, in how we approach it but but essentially, I, I actually stopped reviewing books when I started interviewing the authors of the books because I was like, I can't not give them a five. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Thank you for coming on the channel. But at the same time, like, I, I, I they need to be life changing for me to, to anyway. So, Animal Liberation, that was like, that's a super interesting book. I'm not, did you follow through with, uh, are you a vegetarian or a vegan or anything like that? Um, I've changed a lot of my buying habits. I still eat animal products, which thanks for losing me half of my base just now. Um, <laughs> But, Sorry. Um, I have changed a and lot no of comments. Things, and I think it's a bigger conversation, but that book definitely changed like where I eat, how I eat, uh, for sure, but not, not all the way through. And, and there's some, there's some reasoning, but that's another well, conversation. You will. Yeah. And just to, just to piss off everyone on both sides as well. I was a vegetarian for like six years and just recently, um, have started to introduce some more uh, animals mm. into my diet. And that's going to like, I, I know I'm going to get um hate from both sides but hey like you put you know he's i've called you out now now i have to get some hate as well um notes from the underground obviously classic after afterglow of creation Paran- and i can't see the screen at all it's so far away so oh. yeah i'm counting on you to call it out i wish yeah, i could cool. okay, cool. look at it later all right so we got oh can you can you see if i zoom in oh, that's a way better oh yeah a little better there yeah. yeah okay so sapiens and stoner stoner was just an amazing novel yep and um, if you haven't read all of John Williams stuff, uh, there's a Western that he did that is phenomenal. Butcher's Crossing. They just made a movie version with Nicolas Cage, which doesn't do it justice. It's maybe one of like the top 10 Westerns ever. Uh, it's phenomenal. And then if you haven't done his on Rome, it's great. Like he just writes all over the place. But yes, Stone wow. is that, that book was that was an amazing book. Uh, Notes from the Underground, obviously. Um the Two Towers, you read that higher than Fellowship of the Ring, which I can't understand, but I love, the, like, I really love Fellowship. It, it blew my mind. I'd never read it before. I mainly listen to audiobooks, though, so because I, I can't follow very well with the, the text. So I re- read, listen to an audiobook and I'll take notes and then I'll put it in the actual physical book. That's how I like to do things. Um, Godless, 12 Rules for Life, Waking Up, Let Us Now, here's reading. something else. You, you, now, I, I probably won't have any subscribers tomorrow because people just saw 12 Rules for Life with five stars. Um, <laughs> So I feel the need to to say something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I read that book when I was still. Does it say the year on there? I read uh, it a couple of times because I did a review on it on my channel. But the first time I read it was like the year it came out, which I can't remember what year that was. No, it doesn't say. But anyways, the year that came out, I was like in that middle spot, and I was like, wait a second, is this <laughs> is this the answer to like still being spiritual and 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 allowing the power of the Bible without believing it literally. And I, I like a lot of, you know, that first 12 rules for life instead of beyond order where things start to fall off the rails a little bit was like peak Jordan Peterson of like personal responsibility and like just good, you know, not getting yourself in negative feedback loops. And so I do hate what he's become. I, I, I am so against what he is doing for religion by minimizing the really the uh the literalness of it like he is the person that takes any story 
and just extrapolates it into like meaning, which you can do with anything. Let's do it with the Greek myths. Let's do it with the Egyptian pantheon. Like you, it's, it's, it's cool in that regard, but he's giving it clout that it otherwise doesn't deserve while ignoring the rest of history, which he didn't used to do. So my little caveat, uh, there's a special place in my heart for early Jordan Peterson, like maps of meaning from 96, but, uh, Ooh, things have really changed Ooh. since Daily Wire. Oh man, and I, I'm gonna lose. Let's lose hey, I'll lose some subscribers as well. I actually think a, a lot of what Jordan Peterson's used. Well, I don't know. I don't watch him anymore, but what he what he said was actually really fantastic when it came to psychology. Some of it was actually really beneficial for me in my own life. I've got anxiety and depression. And stuff. Yeah, in his lane as a behavioral psychologist, things were great. Yeah. And then when he stepped out of that lane in the public spotlight, <laughs> oh, man. Things fell apart. when he started going. Well, I've read 50 books on climate change and I don't know if there's any evidence that's man made. You're like, what the fuck? What 50 books are you reading that the client climate scientists aren't reading? Like, I just don't I just don't understand how you can be so bold as to say that because you've read 50 books, you're gonna disagree with the mass, like overwhelming 99.9% .9 of like all climate scientists. Like, I just I just don't I don't get that. And also all these like anti-trans stuff and anti-LGBT stuff, it's yeah. just so disgusting. And um, you know, like He'll uh, what is it? What does he do? He goes um, he goes onto a talk show. He'll 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 tweet on Twitter. He'll tweet on Twitter and say something like, "Sorry, not beautiful," or or, or call someone out by name, like a, yeah. a like a trans folk or an LGBT a member of the LGBT community or or a woman or something. Yeah, it's just a woman who see, was that's overweight. That's the the one you're talking yeah. about is the Sports Illustrated. Just the woman who was overweight, and it's like it's, his most recent. We we don't need to talk about Jordan Peterson forever, but just to get some of those subscribers <laughs> back, his most yeah. recent tweet that I've seen was like the. Uh, the parking, there was like a updated parking law and it had, uh, it reduced accidents and he was like, fascist, you're all going <laughs> to the woke death upon you. And it's like, what? I, I didn't get that quote correct. No. Trust like, me, guys. I see the insanity <laughs> there, but we don't also need to jump on board of just because that yeah. part's wrong. It's all wrong. Like, where's the nuance? Same thing with Sam yeah. Harris and the rest of them. I don't agree with everything. That's yeah. what, it was yeah. so funny to me just now to see waking up and 12 rules for life, both five stars for me. Yeah. It's hilarious. Same. But um, yeah, same because I, I tried to re listen to waking up and I'm, recently I'm like, oh, this isn't that interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, but I'm in place. Um, but but back to Jordan Peterson, it's he's he'll say and not, not to go on, on and on, but I just wanted to finish what I was saying. He was he he would you know go on about like picking on women individually on Twitter, like with his huge million follower audience, and then someone on a talk show will be like, How do you feel about being like the uh essentially the role model for incels? And he'll start crying, like, oh, well, you know, these guys just haven't they just don't have a chance, you know. And it's like, really? You've got empathy for like a group of people who are like generally like misogynistic pricks and like have this like chivalrous like worldview like and you and then like someone who's like really hurting you're like you woke leftist scum like I I just don't understand like he's a partisan hack I'm sorry but some yeah. of the stuff he used to say was really good yeah no, um, I do. <laughs> so but we've we've got a lot of a lot of books in common the meditations of Marcus Aurelius um, a short history of nearly everything endurance. Uh, why I'm not a Christian denialism, but what I want to kind of uh, how to change your mind. You know, that's a, that's a good one. But what I want to kind of ask you is in regards to novels, because you, you know, you like Stoner, you've already given me some, some, um, some other suggestions from him. Are there any other books that you can suggest novels that I should read? Uh, I, I am, it is paralysis by analysis. I will give you a few, but you have to understand like, this was my world before like the last eight months. This is all I did was talk books and recommend books and review books. And, um, and I've, I've, we've talked, I've taken down that channel since then, but, uh, I'll have to send you a few reviews of books. Yes. Let me give you a couple. First of all, we just have to start at the top. Did, have you read any Dostoevsky? Of notes from the underground. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That was on there. So just jump up to the brothers K the brothers Karamazov. You, you have to, <sighs> it's so it's so big. It's no, so it big. It's so readable. And the tension between <laughs> Ivan the atheist and Alyosha uh, or Ayosha, the uh, the believer, is the best rendition in fiction, period, of, again, the tension between the believer and the atheist. It's perfect. And even though I don't come out on the, the correct side, according to Dostoevsky, like, it's still phenomenal. Um, yeah. So if you like Notes from Underground, I promise you will like The Brothers K. Uh, on a totally obscure one that I always recommend to people is A Short Stay in Hell by Stephen L. Peck, who is a Mormon in Utah that wrote this book 
on um you you go to hell this one guy he wakes up and the correct religion i think in that one is like scientology or something ridiculous and so he's in hell but each hell is individual and it plays off the short story of uh jorge luis borges of uh the um the library of babel and it's all about time it's it's the best novel that i have read and so it's more of a short story but it's it's in between a novella of deep time in a fiction sense getting an understanding of what hell in any capacity even if it's not horrendous burning forever just what 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 trillions of years would it really look like it blew my mind and actually i remember finishing that as a christian and thinking this just made the hell concept so much worse because you just say the word infinity and you don't care you say eternity and it doesn't yeah. mean anything. but when you really start to get a, an understanding of it i think that it changes uh, your empathy level for how God could do this. Um, so in regards to what we think, um, I would suggest that one. A short stay in hell. Okay, I'm going to drop it in yes. the um, Stephen chat Elfack. so people can read it. Let me give you one more. Um, mm -hmm. What do you like? Like, give me, give me other than what we saw, like what kind of genre or, or time frame? Or... I mean, my favorite, my favorite books. Um, let me just, I can just tell you my favorite books. So you can, you know, like I started with Ready Player One to give you an idea. Um, and I mean, I, I don't think that's amazing now, but I did at the time. I've got nine favorites. Um, the Fellowship of the Ring, Wild Swans, um, which is about three daughters of China. Uh, Norwegian Wood by Maruki Hurakami. Stoner, Ten Types of Human. Uh, Kafka on the Shore, Ready Player One, God is Not Great, and Sapiens. Yeah, so if, if you like, uh, first of all, have you read... Um... Noah, uh, is it Noah Harari yeah. who wrote Sapiens? Have yeah, you yeah. read his second book after Sapiens? No, I haven't. Well, you should do that. On list. Um, Homo Deus, I think, is the book. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's nonfiction, though. Uh, on the fiction regard, I would do James Joyce. Um, and don't go big like with Ulysses, but do a portrait of the artist as a young man. It is a coming of age story of a Catholic schoolboy that wrestles with his faith and his call into the priesthood uh, because the art is calling him and it's at odds with deep religious belief. And there's a huge chapter on hell, which is phenomenal and it's fiction. Uh, it's probably Joyce's best work in my opinion, but yeah, I would, I would do that one. This, this is what I wanted. This is why I called you onto this show. Cause you just, you just, you just, this is what I wanted. Okay. I've, I've written that down and I'm going to, uh, I'll post that in the um, comments as well. Portraits of a young uh, portrait, the portrait of an artist as a young man. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Um, ah, that looks awesome. I'll, I'll. So, have you read any Murakami, Haruki Murakami? I have. Um, I most recently read. He has a book. He's a runner, and despite my larger uh, <laughs> frame right now, I I was an endurance runner for years and years, and I'll I'll get back there. But he has a book on running. What I think about when I think about running. And it's phenomenal. Yeah. And it's not just about running. It's mainly about his time as an author. So it goes back to his first short stories. It goes back to when he got big. I mean, it's it's the writer writing about writing, which is my favorite kind of writing. Uh, do, so, do, you, do you like his writing style? I like it okay. Um, there's things I love. There's things I don't. You know, he's gotten a lot of flack recently for his misogyny. I think that's maybe not understood yeah. super well in terms of like, yeah, he, maybe he just doesn't write females well. You know, there's, there's a lot there. But... Um, <laughs> I like him a lot. I think that he's interesting enough. And after hearing him talk about his writing, all it makes you want to do is read him. So, yeah. And look, I actually pull these off the bookshelf because I can't recommend them enough. They're a little perverted, some parts, but they're, they, they're definitely w were mind blowing. Kafka on the Shore uh, by Murakami. There's got magical realism in there. It's about someone who runs away. They're trying to escape their past. It's really good. Um, and that one, that one was like blew my mind in that. Like it's, it's a good book. Uh, and everyone should read that. But the one that that like like changed me as a person, like a novel that changed me as a person, weirdly enough, was again Murakami, Norwegian Wood. Wood. Yeah, um, about teen angst, suicide, sex, um, love, depression, anxiety, and it's literally it's almost about nothing. But when you you read it, it's just the way that it kind of just draws you into the story. It's incredible. I, I, uh, yeah, Murakami favorite author. His it's it's incredible. It's like you just read. It. It's really good. Um, I, I can't recommend them enough. Have you done other? Man, I don't want to sound stupid. It's he's, it's Japanese, correct? Uh yeah. Have you read like Mishima? Uh, is he the one that wrote, um, No Longer Human? 
I'm not sure about that one. My favorite from his, my favorite from him is the sailor who fell from grace with the sea, something to that extent. Um, if you like Japanese literature, I think Mishima over, over, uh, Murakami, Murakami. but something to something. Okay. To no, I haven't. I'll have to check him out. I'm not a huge, like I wasn't like into anime or anything. Mm. Um, but, but yeah. Okay. Looks cool. Yeah. It's just, it's just something about like, I really love literature. Um, it's the it's uh, the only thing I think the King James Bible is good for, to be honest. Um, is but not exclusively. Book. You need. To, we talked about this before. My last recommendation uh, here it is: a starting entry point to get you into the Greek myths is read um, Stephen Fry. He did uh, Mythos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've started, I've, started, I've started on the audiobook. I okay. and. It's something I need to really focus on because I never, I don't understand any of the stories. So it's been, it's, it's there. It's it is a match of all reading. the stories. So you could pick a particular mm -hmm. story, like you know, everyone loves Circe by Madeline Miller, which I love. I mean, if you just wanted like an, like an introduction to five characters, uh, Circe is beautiful. It's it's one of the most gorgeous books I've ever read. Madeline Miller is a goddess, um, but Mythos does give the entire pantheon of of Greek myth all in one book. So. I'm, yeah, I'm, if I could convert you onto one thing, it would be getting into your Greek myths. Oh, it's the, what do you think about the Iliad and the Odyssey? Should I? Should I... Oh, I mean, yeah. If you're going to say the Bible is like good in terms <laughs> of a foundational text of Western canon, then yes, you need to read. Uh, you need to read Homer. If um, if everyone can get get a, a why in the chat that um, Derek from Midvision and Brandon should meet up and talk about this because that's like Derek. Derek's jam. It's oh, like cool. everyone just spam why if you think it's yes for why yes in the chat because like that. Have you seen these documentaries? Derek's documentaries about this? Like it's not um, on not on this. Uh the day that I came out with my God and Anatomy series, he launched his three and a half hours uh documentary <laughs> on that. And I was like, thanks, bro. I was gonna do one chapter a week and you just did three and a half hours of the whole book. Um, so I'm still Look, recovering I, from that, but I'll check out the other. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, uh, I, I, and we got, we're getting a bunch of, um, yeses, um, in the chat. Um, we, <laughs> that all in Hebrew. Thanks, Kip. Um, Kip does a stream learning Hebrew. I'm not reading Hebrew. Sorry. Um, but one of the things that I will say is, uh, about Derek is, uh, and, and this is, I won't mention names, but he's had like prominent Bible scholars reach out to him and be like, your documentaries are changing my perspective mm -hmm. about the influence on, on, uh, on literature, on, on Christian writings that maybe they, they do have a huge influence from um, like, like I'm talking about stories copied and things like that. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's not something to be just like um, laughed off, like the Zeitgeist movie or whatever. It's like some of the stuff is like pretty, pretty profound. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Okay, well, let me just end on before we, on one last question that I ask everyone before we jump into the super chats. And so, thank you for staying for a little bit uh, over time. Yep. But this is a question I like to ask people: What is the most plausibly true religion that you don't believe in? Plausibly true is different than how I normally think of this. Is like what is the most beneficial if we had to choose one? Plausible is very different. Um, geez. <sighs> That's so hard because I find so many gaps in all of the man-made myths that we have. Uh, honestly, there are parts of, and and this is this is where there might be some pushback because you could argue it's as much a philosophy as it is a religion. There are aspects of Buddhism that I think, if you were just trying to make a case for like, you have a, a figurehead that is living a life in a certain capacity that is you know giving enlightened truth and and some precise. Uh, attitudes and actions to follow to reach the same kind of thing like that to me is better than a god who exists outside of space and time you know in terms of plausibility but that doesn't i don't know they're all implausible that's the problem give me a good one i i refuse to answer this question mm. <laughs> i mean <laughs> most you, people what is the most plausible one i that you don't believe. well it's great because christians can ask answer it right anyone can answer it like that's that's the beauty of it. I can tell you what most people choose. What's what do most that. people choose? Most people choose Buddhism because it's non-theistic. So I've yeah. started to say like you can't you can't choose okay. Buddhism. And and that's where I went right. Be, um, yeah. They're I can all, they all. I can have tell you their... what Matt Delahunty's is. What? I can tell you what Matt Delahunty's is. 
What is it? It came on. Judaism. You know what? That's a fantastic answer. Uh, and so I'm going to steal it, but I'll, I'll expand before I even hear what his answer was. It's Judaism because you're not trying to marry two exclusive things together. It's Judaism because you can just go with God's character as described in one section of the Bible, and you don't have to agree with it. And yes, it even comes off as evil, but plausible doesn't mean the kind of God you would want to worship. So yeah, I totally understand that answer. That's great thinking. Of course, Matt got there. I really like that answer. I think I think I, I change my answer all the time, but something to do with um, like the Baha faith or or, or Sikhs or not Sikhs is it? It's not Sikhs. It's um, Jains who like. Oh, I was going to say Jainism is my. That's what I wanted to answer for most beneficial. Like if we had to choose a religion to rule the world, I don't think it's plausible. I mean, first of all, we cannot all walk around with a broom everywhere we go, making sure to push every ant out of the way. Um, you know, to cause yeah, no but harm. The, but the new Yeezys will come out with like a little swastika and then like little like jets that push air out the front that sure. like move all the, yeah. yeah so you know, we'll yeah. That to look to. yeah, you're right. We've, we've caught up <laughs> that religion. Um, no, it's, yeah. I mean, I would say that's, if I had to choose a religion to be like, Hey, you all need something to believe in. You need something to ground your morality in Jainism, but, yeah. uh, plausibility, they all fail. They all fail. Hmm. Yeah. It's because you're a left wokeism. <laughs> okay, some super chats. Um, we actually have some non super chats as well. Um, people were asking in the chat before, why don't I ask all questions? Is because we're already over time, and um, you know, sometimes we can't even get to all the super chats. So, thank you, Brennan, for staying back. But uh, Brandon's channel has really helped me out. Thanks, man. Uh, there's a lot of chats like this. This isn't a, this isn't a super chat, but just to start us off, um, Michael Beverly Brandon is the guy that got me started on this YouTube journey. He encouraged me to get serious. Love you, brother. You mean a lot to me. Anyway, I got to run. I'll have to watch later. Much love. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Michael has. Um, I've only been able to check out some of his channel. He's just getting started. Show him some love as well. But I've been really mm. impressed with his approach on stuff. So absolutely, got no problem yeah. endorsing that. We need to do a, we should we do a trio stream one time with like the three beards? Because his beard is just like, I'll lose, but his beard is just fantastic. I'll lose soon too. I've got a business trip coming up. I got to take this down. <laughs> oh, no, no. no um, uh, Claude Simeon, thank you for the super chat. Gents, I love watching both your streams. Such vids. Thank you very much. Um, Critical Faculty, $5. Just a good day from um, my good buddy, uh, for my good buddy Dave and his guest Brandon, and keep up the good work, lads. Thank you, Hanny from Critical Faculty. I really appreciate it. His channel is awesome as well. Uh, Nitty, I love this episode of Deep Shift. <laughs> as always, keep I drinking. <laughs> and then we've actually got some Better questions. Than mind uh, drinks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mind drinks. <laughs> Very good. <Yeah. laughs> so Aaron Carlson asked, Thank you for the Tindall Super Chat. Most miracles I saw in church could be classified as BS. The one I personally saw that I still cannot explain doesn't change my conclusion now. Either of you have a similar experiences. Um, I, I don't see the text in front of me, so I'd want to reread it. Is he saying that he believes that was still a miracle? He just can't explain it or he doesn't believe anymore, but that's the one thing that still kind of bugs him. Uh, that one, the, the one that I personally saw, I still cannot explain. It's a, but it doesn't change his opinion, even though he can't explain it. Um, yeah. have you, so that he's asking essentially, have we had experiences where we've seen miracles? Uh, I think I can't, I personally have been able to go back in the Rolodex of my mind as unbiased as I can and say, what is the human condition at play here? And for almost all of them, I've been able, I think for all of them, I've been able to explain, uh, what was really going on. And that would, that would be a longer conversation. So I guess my answer is no, there's, there's not still one thing where it's, you know, all of the healings that I saw were unverifiable. It was someone's wrist hurt and then it didn't, you know, like mm. I've, I've been able to write that stuff off. There's, there's nothing that I have seen. There were some demonic events that took me a long time before I finally came, what I had considered demonic events before I was able to say, that was just me. I was so indoctrinated with this. My mother read the book of martyrs to me at night for bedtime stories of these people that were possessed and died for Christ and had demons attacking them in the night and breaking their arm and things like this. It was so ingrained in my psyche that of course I had those experiences when I was scared and alone in the dark. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been able to, from a, a, a brain level and a psycho, a psychology level, be able to understand what was really at play for, for all of those in my life, personally speaking. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm 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 the same in that. I I remember at at like a youth camp looking at a friend convulsing on the floor and and putting his arms in the shape of a cross and saying that he had visions afterwards and for hours everyone laughing and falling over in the spirit. I remember saying to myself, I can never deny this. I can never deny what I'm seeing here. And I don't, <laughs> I just don't land at the same conclusion of what was happening there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, the last week I mentioned um, seeing one of my friends, Carmen, fall over in the spirit, pass out and wake up. And for the first time in 15 years, she came over to our house to catch up the other day. And I asked her about it. And she said that she thinks that it was, she's not a Christian anymore. She's an atheist. And she says that she's not, she thinks it's not, uh, not something that like, it was just something that worked. Like you get so worked up in the emotional yeah. that you want something to be so true. And you, you and she just passed, she passed out like someone would at a Beatles concert. Or yeah, whatever. exactly. It's all explainable human, even uh, just it's a part of the human experience. It's, it's, it's a weirder part. It's a more seldom part and it takes certain things to get there, but you can get there in a lot of different ways. There are people that when the music plays just right, there are people that do a certain drug. There are people that have a certain kind of orgasmic experience. There's all kinds of things that get our brain to the same thing. And they've been able to see that in FRMI machines and all kinds of stuff that it, we we're beginning to be, even with NDEs, we're beginning to be able to explain this stuff from a neuroscience level that takes the gap out that we previously had to fill with god or spiritual experience i know some people really like they they still don't have an answer and i appreciate his honesty to be like oh, i can't explain it but i have enough evidence against it on the contrary yeah for sure uh and jason rollins thank you for the five dollar super chat uh is there a specific reason why jesus couldn't come down once a year and be crucified by angels in front of crowds of different parts of the world yeah uh, i like jason he's a good commenter he's a supporter of my channel uh, so Jason, yeah. thanks for being here and supporting Dave as well. Um, no, there's not a reason. This is, this is, you know, what, what, uh, David and I were talking about earlier. There's, there's no good reason that this God cannot continue to reveal himself. Um, if he wanted to, everyone could have seen his one crucifixion. We could all be born with that memory. You know, he could have developed the first videotape. Like there are so many silly, but thousands of answers that, if you're really talking about a supernatural God that did all these supernatural things, why do we have to even put him in a box where we would need him to physically show up in all different generations and do the same thing? Like, why was the one time not self-evident uh, for everyone? It's it's so it's so amazing to me the excuses we come up with for him. Not that you were doing that, Jason. Just that it's unnecessary. This is an all-powerful God. We could be born with that image burned into our mind before anyone had to tell us about it. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> I like what I said to, um, not to toot my own, but I like what I said to Michael Jones. I said, I've been inspiring for you. I said, oh man, you and God just make it way too complicated. <laughs> for, sure. for sure. Well, uh, my face is really red. I just looked at myself in the mirror. This alcohol is really affecting me and I've got to do a full day of work after this. Well, half a day of work after this. You're an Aussie. You should be just fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Brendan, for coming on. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, everyone go check out mind shift on youtube that is i'll link it in the description um into into the chat right now it is an, a wonderful channel i really mean that um fantastic and when you go over there leave a little um drink emoji of your of your choice margarita coffee scotch or whatever so he knows you've come from deep drinks but thank you so much brendan for coming on it's been an absolute pleasure is there anything you'd like to say before we finish off the interview no, man. Um, I'm really happy to be here. This was, uh, I've done a, a couple things like this now, and this was like the most chill, but also still some really good deep conversations. Um, feel like I made a friend just really enjoyed uh, hanging out with you for real. Just great. Cool. So thanks for having well, me. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm coming over to eat spaghetti and play Mario Kart at your house. That's what I do with my friends. So that sounds good. <laughs> okay. I'll see everyone later. Bye.